night again we're live 9 p.m here again so i'd like to thank you for joining in if you're first time visitor welcome appreciate having you on the show uh today we've got a few things we're going to cover at the beginning here before uh anybody can uh, jump in i want to go over a couple things so <clears throat> first thing we're going to cover here is uh is what's new in the uh, sony alpha rumors and just see What's coming out? I haven't even looked yet. I've been so busy trying to set this this stream up tonight, and I wanted to get into uh, uh, some stuff about astrophotography. And the main reason why is I'm currently planning a trip for astrophotography and trying to get that all set up and out. And I thought, what a great opportunity to share with you what I know about it and put it together. So, uh, if you're if you're here, hit me up in the comments. Let me know you're here. Let me know where you're from, what you shoot, all that good stuff. I like to always talk to you guys and see see what's new. And uh, I'm just gonna be going through here. So the first thing, let me uh, let me share the screen with you guys so you can see what's what we got going on here. Oh, so, gotta add this one. There it is. All right. So big teaser: new major Sony rumors will be posted on August eighth. So it's tomorrow. And look at these cameras. What do we got here? I uh, don't know what that is. Um, the date for the next Sony announcement and products will be announced on that day. Nothing really specific. We're Right now, we're assuming it's going to be the A7C uh, Mark II. And there's a rumor that it's the A7C-R. So a high-resolution, possibly 61 megapixel R uh, compact camera. Be something very interesting to find out. Um, and also, you know, you guys, while, while it's on my top of my head, make sure if you can't hear me or you got any kind of issues with the audio, let me know so I can get that corrected right away. Because uh, as far as I know, it sounds good in the, in the headphones, but it's hard to hear over my own voice sometimes. So, um, yeah, so we, hopefully maybe we'll see something tomorrow, you guys. Uh, that's usually Tuesdays. I think the general rule of thumb is, you know, Tuesdays we get our release information. So might be good. Uh, Sony's kept the lead with 42% CMOS sensor market share. So the other night we were we were joking around in uh, another live stream over there at uh, at Robert Silver's, and we were saying, you know, hey, who is going to have the first camera to uh, take a picture of an alien? Um, you know, I guess it can go pretty deep pretty quick there. But anyways, uh, it's a good chance it's a Sony sensor at least at the uh, sensors out there on the market. So 42%. Uh, Samsung's 19% of the sensors, and we go up here, Canon's only 1%. Now, that's just their cameras, I'm guessing, is the Canon sensors. So we definitely got that. And then uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, Galaxy Core, all these brands I've never heard of. But, yeah, 42% still market share on that. That's pretty dang good. Uh, let's see what's next. Uh, da, 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 da. Full circle, yeah. Got a Minolta Auto Record 5814. I mean, just an old lens. Looks like I've got a couple of these old lenses. Uh, definitely check out some of that stuff. Yeah, Team Sony. Who we got here? Emil Abraham. So, yeah, Team Sony. Yes, sir. So, which camera are you shooting there, uh, Emil? Emil, am I saying that right? <laughs> Hope I am. Uh, anyways, yeah, some of these old lenses can be a lot of fun to shoot, and you know the nice thing about mirrorless is all these cameras will do it. So yeah, that's some cool stuff, nice images. All right, I think that's about how we're gonna be. Let's go one more page. I don't like to spend too much time in here uh, until we know more about what's going on. Okay, so this is a first rumor about a new GM lens coming along the new A7C. Uh, let's see. The source didn't want to go into, into trouble, get into trouble, therefore didn't share the specs of the lens, but he said the lens is going to be a gimbal lens, which leads me to believe it, this might be the new 1635 GM Mark II. So what are your thoughts on a, 
a new gimbal lens that they could be making. Now, if it is GM, the 1635 definitely makes a lot of sense. They just released the 1635 F4 power zoom. Now, it's unlikely they would have a power zoom setting in this lens, but you got to also remember Sony does make this lens essentially in a cinema grade lineup that's about five grand or so that has a power zoom setting. So, so are we going to get an internal power zoom lens that's 2.8 with an on off switch and a, and a normal ring, or is it all going to be power zoom? It would be, be interesting to see. Uh, if it's not a 1635, I think a great gimbal lens would be like a 20 to 50 or a 24 to you know 70. But we have those lenses, so it's unlikely we're going to get a lightweight GM lens that does that in the gimbal. But definitely, definitely interested about this because I've been waiting for that that Mark II 1635 GM to come out. I've always wanted the first one, never bought it, but I definitely would like to see a Mark II come out with the newer technology. Sorry about that clank. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's right. I shoot on an A7 II. Hey, man, I started on an A7 II as my first full frame, and that's a great camera. The... Um, it, I, you know, the only reason why it didn't last long for me was, uh, I'll pop that off there. The only reason why it didn't last long for me was I jumped up into the A7R2 uh, for eye autofocus because I was all about portraits and getting awesome shots and, and following the people I was following on YouTube at the time. Just seemed like it made a good idea. Uh, the A7R2 is definitely a step up in camera from the A7 II, but the A7 II is still a phenomenal camera. And, you know, Sony still sells it to this day. So there's really nothing you can't go wrong with that camera at all. It's a it's a great, great camera. Um, okay, I think that's going to be about it for the Alpha Rumors. So let's top into the main event here. So I, uh, I try to do at least one dark sky astrophotography event a year, at least for me, because takes a lot to get get out that far over a weekend for me um and and you have to do it it's uh during you know milky way season so and weather's got to be right you don't want to be going out when it's cloudy so really the best month for me is always seems to be right around august and that's and what's special to me is because i started this channel in august well i'll take that back i, I made the first film in august and i soon thereafter posted it and that's the seeking darker skies so this channel's got that heritage in it for the seeking darker skies and oh give me a sec here uh i've done a few episodes revolving around that and if you go back to my channel this there's a playlist called seeking darker skies i think there's about four episodes on there that i made the first one's kind of a it's like my first video. We didn't really feel comfortable talking in front of the camera. It's a lot of it got cut and, and moved around to just being like a, a nice little cinematic sequence. And then pictures and text and I didn't talk and, you know, stuff for that. But uh, it, it's definitely something I'm going to continue on this channel. And so the next one is Seeking Darker Skies 2, where me and Daniel, who, who also was featured in the first one, uh, went up to go shoot the Neowise comet. This was during 2020. So I started this channel around 2019, and I, I we wanted to go do this, or at least I did, and I know Daniel had an interest in it, but uh, we went out to go do the Seeking Darker Skies uh, comet, or, I'm oh, sorry, we went to do the Neowise comet, and I made it my Seeking Darker Skies 2, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the Seeking Darker Skies 2, get this off here real quick. We did the, the okay. Uh, we did the Seeking Darker Skies too, and uh, we we hiked up the mountain pretty much to get a view. And, and the clouds were not always fully cooperating. We had a narrow window because the comet was only around for so many days. Uh, I had a, a second day availability to go out and try again. I just didn't want to make a two hundred mile trek a, a second time. But anyways, we made it work, and it, and it worked out. We got the shot we wanted, and then we did Seeking Darker Skies or I did, Seeking Darker Skies 3, which is, I think, going down to Terlingua and shooting the Dark Skies down Terlingua. Absolutely epic place to go shoot. If you haven't ever ever been down in that south part of Texas, it's it really is remarkable. Something totally different, but definitely worth worth the effort. And then uh, my fourth episode was um, my bucket shot, which is a 
Um, it's a private ranch and I have access to it. And I have, there's a rock wall where it's southerly facing and there's the Milky Way above it. So if you watch back that video, you'll see uh, where I, it didn't work out that trip because of the clouds. And we had to uh, you know, make a compos composite, which I, I don't like doing composites. I'd never print a composite, but I got the gist of what I wanted out there, what I was expecting to find. Well, it turns out we're going to be doing this again. Hopefully this weekend I'm going to be going out and capturing this image. So I got two nights to try, and it should be possible. It's 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 the right time of month. It's clear out, and there should be no problem getting the stars. So with that, let's dive right into the whole astro how to. How do you how do you plan or how do you what do you need to do to be successful with astrophotography? And I'm actually just going to show you. Hold on. Pull this file up. Um, where are we at here? I've got my, my pictures here. Let me get one of these things up. All right, pull this right over here. Let's go big on that. And let me put this on the screen. So this right here is one of the images I captured from the very first episode of Seeking Dark Skies. And this is the, the highlight photo. This is one I printed. And it's just an amazing image for me because it was my first attempt at it and it helps having the right gear. So what do you need to make a successful image? Well, you only need a camera and a lens. You need a tripod and you need some dark skies, some, some stars to shoot, something like that. And that's all you really need to go out and, and get that stuff. But it works a lot better if you get the stuff you're going to want to have also. Now, I, you can take a kit lens and shoot the Milky Way with it. A 3.5 or an F4 lens have no problem at all capturing the Milky Way. And it, it's relatively easy. You just you got to make sure your tripod's locked down nice and tight and that there's no real movement in it. And then you're going to have to, you know, shoot on the wide end. That's the safest bet. Uh, and also, that's where your lenses are usually the brightest on a kit lens. So crank that thing back to I've got like a hair flying around in my eye. It's driving me crazy here. Sorry. Um, crank that lens wide. Keep it at, you know, like 3.5 or F4, and you can shoot the Milky Way. Now, we're going to get into some other details about that and how, how to make it good, but that's one of the things you can do. So the first thing uh, you're going to want to take with you is one thing you got to know is the time that you're going to go do it. And that time is going to be important to the moon's uh, cycle. So you want to do this during a new moon phase. It is possible during, during other phases of, of the, uh, the lunar calendar because the moon does rise late or it sets early, depending on where it's at. So you got to plan your shot around that moon time and when it's going to be out of the sky to capture a clean image of the Milky Way, like the one I just showed you. Now, let me, uh, let me just throw that up there. Uh, this one. There we go. So that's one of the things you're going to want to uh, uh, have in your plan. But you're going to need, uh, because it's going to be out there and you're going to be dark, don't forget to take a flashlight. Now, me personally, I'm, I like to pack a little overprepared for such things. So the first thing you're going to want to have uh, with the light is some sort of like headlamp here. Okay, so this is something I'll keep on my head the whole night, and I'm going to put it on here because uh, oh, let's see, <laughs> I got my headphones on. Well, anyways, you're going to want something that's pretty bright that you can see around with, and this one has a, a little bit of a tilt function, so you can tilt it down to your feet. Uh, anyways, and then it's also got modes. You've got a red and a green. Now, I do find that the red probably works the best out doing nighttime photography. We also got some modes, I think, uh, brightness levels and a strobe. So that's definitely something you're going to want to have. And uh, like I said, you don't need it to do astrophotography, but it helps. And that's, that's why it's one of the ones you're going to want. Now, in addition to that, I carry a backup, a little smaller, lighter, simple white light. 
uh, one, redundancy in batteries, it's redundancy in lights, if something happens to it, uh, whatever happens, you're, it's out there, you're in the dark, usually you're in a natural environment where there's no man-made objects because that's where the cool scenes are at, so you got to sometimes hike in a little ways and, and get in there, you want to be able to see when you're doing that. In addition to this stuff, I also carry at least one regular flashlight torch like this, so this is a Streamlight flashlight. It's incredibly durable. They're, they're not necessarily cheap, but neither is photography equipment. Uh, this is a metal case. Um, it's rock solid. It's extremely powerful and bright. Uh, and it's got dimmable modes, and it's also an emergency strobe. So uh, you flash out in the sky, some, you're getting somebody's attention should you uh, be requiring it. So that's another thing I always like to carry. And then depending how heavy you're packing, you can always get a much larger torch. Now, this one I like to carry with me. Uh, it's a nice long distance light and it pencil beams down pretty well. So the nice thing about this is you can light paint with it. So it's bright and pushing that light out, you can get beams of light with it. If you want to do, you know, standing there with a beam of light coming off, you going into the stars. That's a bright, powerful light that you have nice solid beams going up to to, to the sky uh, let's see if i think i have one i can show you i should be prepared and i'm not i should have did all this uh, let's see where we at um i have a bunch of folders with different pictures and nothing's ready to go so i'm sorry The beam of light photo at. I found it like 20 times and now I can't find it. Of course, that's how it would be. I should have been more prepared. Sorry, guys. I know it's in here somewhere. Um. Oh my gosh, this is driving me crazy. I'm sorry. I don't want to stall out on this stupid picture. <laughs> oh, more finals. There it is. Maybe. Okay, here we go. So here is a beam of, of light. So oh, let me make it big. All right, so this is uh, another photo we did. Uh, a friend of mine standing out in the uh, in the foreground, and we've got this big bright light across the lake, shining this white beam all the way across the lake at us in the long exposure. So that was that was a cool a cool image. And then I thought, hey, you know, let's let's put a light flashlight in the sky. And I am pretty sure we used this guy to push this big blue light torch up through the uh, through the stars like that, but. That's, uh, that's another reason why you'd want to carry a big, heavy, heavy flashlight. So that's the uh, the first thing you're going to want to have to play with stars and is, you know, get out and, and do that. Now, the next thing you're going to be wanting to do is, uh, is you're going to want to probably upgrade to a fast glass. And when I say fast glass, I mean something like this 24 F14 G Master lens. This is... Really, the astrophotographer's dream lens. I got this lens for the purpose of shooting the stars, and I've put full use to it. This thing, uh, it it has a way of reproducing the stars uh, that keeps them really, really nice little sharp little specks. And they don't. There's this, what they call sagittal flare, which is a little flare bit off the light, the way that the lens renders the light. And this lens controls that very, very well. So. This on the A7R2 is is my setup, and every image you pretty much see is you know shot with this kind of setup. So that's one thing you're going to want to upgrade to right away is get a, a bit of fast glass. Now, 24s, it, what, where it's going to affect you is when you're shooting an image like that, it's going to affect how long you can keep shutter open by your focal length. So if you're shooting, say you want to put the 8514 on it. And we put this 85 uh, out there. 
we can take an image of the stars and get in nice and tight to something and get a, a more of a closer perspective. The problem is we can't leave the shutter open as long because the stars are constantly moving and you'll get that motion blur of the stars to get a properly exposed Milky Way shot or a shot of that. So that's where you're going to come into things like the third item you're going to want, which is a star tracker. So the star tracker is something that I've got it here ready. This I did have ready for you guys. Um, Oh, come on. There we go. Put this back up on the screen. Uh, this is a, here at B&H, we got a, a Skywatcher Star Adventure. And this is an older model. It's It's been coming down in price a little bit, which I always like. I always like finding bargains. But something like this is what you're going to need to track the stars. So now you can't do foreground shots with this. And I, I, I'm partial to doing foreground earth element shots and not doing composites. I don't want to shoot one like during the day and blend it into the night. I, shadows are fine with me unless you can light paint it. But something like this uh, allows you to track the stars. And if you put this 85 on there and you want to track the stars, you could get like, you know, Orion or something, you know, a constellation type shot perfectly still with the track. And there's different levels and varieties of these things. The biggest thing you want to remember is with photography you can get a couple more seconds of exposure probably without blurring, but if you really want to be right, you got to make sure you get the polar alignment uh, wedge, which is, I, I believe this is that base plate that creates that kind of a wedge shape in it. It's just the way it turns it just right. So when it's rotating, you're rotating with, with the Earth's uh, rotation properly. And that'll lock down your stars for you so you can do stacked images, long exposures. I mean, you're talking 30 30, 40 exposures, you know, at a minute, minute and a half, two minutes each, you know, at say an F8, really, really sharp, sharp photos like that. And that's where you'd be able to get those, uh, those locked down, pinpoint tack sharp stars. And then, uh, let's see, the last thing, okay, the last thing you're going to want is some really, really dark skies. So the light pollution is what's going to affect and kill your image. So the image I was showing you earlier with that stars i use a tool like this which is a light pollution map and which as you can see here looking at the united states it's it's all you know very bright on the east coast and we got a lot of dark spaces out in the west side now i'm right here in kind of the west texas area and you can see if we get down here into the terlingua area uh, and big bend there's, there's this area where the national park and the state park where big bend are we get down into Terlingua, which is right here near the Mexican border, which is the Rio Grande here. And this area, if you click on it, okay, right here, it says it's a Bortle class one. And this is pretty much, there's a 10 scale Bortle uh, of the, there's 10 levels of brightness. And if you go and Google these charts, and I've got some videos explaining this, but 10 levels of brightness for your, for your portal and class one would be the darkest. So very minimal, minimal light pollution. But as you can see coming out here, get this closed out. So like you get into the red spots or these white spots, these are hot spots. So let's go up here to Dallas and we click on it. And it's a portal class eight or nine. You're not seeing any stars in that. It's, it's way too bright. Now where you can see stars, if you're, if you're in an area that's got some green or blue, these are like class five, I believe, class four. I've successfully shot the Milky Way on F4 in a class four if it's dark. And you got to be really dark, but, you know, the sky's got to be clean, too. You got to have any dust in the air. You can't have any uh, any real, uh, you know, haze or anything like that. It's got to be clean and crisp and the, the stars at its best right after a rain because it just drops all that dirt out of the sky and the, the stars really, really pop. But... You want to be looking for this. So definitely, this is a, a lightpollutionmap.info. This is my go-to resource. There's different sections and areas in here. If you go up here and change it to say, uh, let's go look at like a, this. I use World Atlas primarily, and it's pretty accurate. Let's just go to Verge 2022. Uh, this is some different uh, types of measuring, and I don't fully understand. But you can see there's a lot more darkness out there, and this is maybe a more accurate depiction of what you have. But it's it's those little specks of light are all those little towns popping up everywhere down here. And you can see, you can get further, further out uh, and get into the dark areas. So you can see New Mexico is very dark, Colorado, Utah, Nevada, 
and then you've got the whole West Coast. Uh, California here is pretty lit up. Let's go hop back and look at the World Atlas 2015. You can see you get a lot of this glow. Now, this, this pour over is what I like to look at, and that's why I use this one. You get that pour over, and that pour over can affect your images on the horizons uh, or at, really at the base image of your, of your horizon line. You'll get a little bit of a glow sometimes, depending where that pour over is coming from. So if you're shooting south uh, up here in Nevada, you might have some pour over on the very bottom of your image. Uh, from like Vegas or something. So definitely stuff to keep in, in mind of where you're planning to shoot at. All right, let's get into some comments here. So uh, uh, we talked to Emil. Uh, Cooley's here. Cooley, welcome, man. We'll get the code out here shortly. You made it, darn dogs. You yeah, made it, darn dogs. Oh, your dogs maybe kept you going. Uh, and then let's see. We got Emil. Do you use any applications to watch where certain stars are? So... I don't use any apps, star watching apps. I just kind of, I've kind of learned where the stars are at and what I'm looking for. The planets are what move around the most. Um, and I know which direction. The Milky Way core, you want to be facing south for that. If that, that's that core band, like in the image I showed you earlier. So you want to be, I'll just pull it back up for those of the joined in here recently. Uh, not that one. Shoot, where am I at here? Did I close it? Get it back open up here. Um, there it is. Okay, so you're gonna want, you know, this is directly south pretty much when you are looking at it. And I believe this one at the time was Jupiter, and I think there was one, I want to say this was like Saturn right here or something. So these are the ones that move around a lot in your in your night sky, and uh you'll you'll see those changes, but they're also the brightest, brightest stars. Um now, naked eye, when you're out in this and you're looking at this naked eye, you're not going to see this color. You're not going to see the, the detail. But you will see these two white clouds, and they almost look like at night. They look like a thin cloud layer crossing the sky. And if you're really out where it's really, really dark, you will see that kind of uh, what looks like a haze. And you'll start, if you let your eyes just focus in on it and just soak in that light, just like a long shutter, your eyes will start seeing more and more detail. And as long as you don't move your eyes too much, you, you'll start seeing stuff and you'll start seeing these little dark spots. And you will see also this dark center is incredibly dark. And that's what, what I call the core. I don't know if it's a proper term, but we call that the galactic core. Uh, and that is actually darker when you're looking at it than the stars to the left and the right of the, the, the cloud. So that's how you can determine that you're looking at it uh, naked eye. And it, it's prominent. You'll know it once you know it and recognize it. You'll see it. Uh, you know, it's a nice. I think we were talking about the, the 24 back uh, then. Hey. Yeah, I didn't know you did astro photography. Yeah, that's, uh, that's my passion right there is, uh, is astro. I, it's what I've kind of. That's what I like doing the most. I'm like getting out, like I was saying earlier in this, uh, is the reason why I'm doing this live tonight or around the, uh, around it is I'm actually packing and getting ready to make my second attempt at uh, a shot I've been wanting for a long time. And the location's uh, it's accessible for me, uh, not to pretty much anybody else, but uh, it's, it's this location that I, I didn't get it last time because of clouds. There's a video on my YouTube channel about it called My Bucket Shot. And I'm going to, I got two nights to hopefully try to, try to get it uh, uh, going this weekend. So that's, that's my plan. That's high. Uh, I would jump on, don't feel well. Oh man, I hope, hope you get feeling better. That's uh, that's never fun. It's uh, a cool, useful site. Yeah, that's the, uh, the sound. And we got sound effects. Ah, yes. <laughs> yeah, got a few of them going. And oh, caught me off guard. <laughs> it must have been with the with the, the clapping. So, yeah. If, uh, if you don't know uh, uh, Robert, definitely go check out his channel. He he's does live on Thursday nights at uh, 5 p.m. Pacific and 7 p.m. Central. So definitely worth watching there. Get a get a good get a good group of guys going over there. All right. So back to uh, the stars and what I'd like to do with this is. Um, let me get back in here, minimize this. Let's do that one. All right. So 
what I like to do is I prep, especially if you're going somewhere new. And if you're going somewhere new, you want to know your location. And I always plan for two locations usually just because weather can change or anything like that can happen where I'm going to want to have a, a contingency plan to where I can go. If, if I'm going one way and we got clouds and they're not going to clear out by night because clouds will generally dissipate and disappear at night, especially down here in Texas. But um, if uh, your, your, your plan is for set for a day and you're usually shooting around that new moon, you're going to go out and you're going to have at least, I, I like to have at least a hundred mile separation of my contingency plan. So I'll pick two locations, a primary and a secondary location. Just to have a backup because there's a lot of effort going into make a trip like this and stuff you got to take and planning and, and just being prepared. So I, I like to make sure it's worth my while. So plan your locations and, and, and you know, to find a spot, study past work, F find somebody else's image that you, you like, or you can intrigued by if you're not familiar with an area or you want, you want to set yourself a target goal where you want to get to work up to that spot. Cause sometimes these are very remote and you got to plan around all that stuff. So definitely do your homework on your location, study Google maps, study the terrain, study, you know, like if there's hiking trails nearby, if there's bike trails, whatever the case may be, know that also know the inherent risks with that location you know are we going to be in heat like out here in texas it was 109 today it's probably 100 degrees outside right now even though it's dark it doesn't cool off when the sun sets out here it's really weird we're like on the west coast nevada california can be a nice hot 90 100 degree day and then that sun drops below boom it drops 10 15 degrees instantly and it doesn't happen out here like that it takes all night for it to cool off that 20 degrees to like 80 and then that sun pops back up and it's 90 instantly so Always know your risk, plan accordingly with that. Um, and always be aware of the physical dangers involved with it, as whether it be animal, wildlife, people. Know your location and what you're going to be expecting to find there. If it's a very popular photography spot where there's a lot of image being taken, you may come across other photographers, and I haven't ever come across a, a bad <laughs> another photographer, you know, <laughs> but they're out there and you, you want to be respectful of your guys' space. You're also going to want to um, make sure that, you know, if you are going out somewhere that remote, that if you are the only one there, somebody else knows where you're at. And you always tell somebody back home where those locations are you planning on being or are at, where you plan on parking if you're hiking away from your car, or all that stuff. So they can, in case you don't come back, they can come looking for you. Always, always just plan accordingly with that. Um, and always stick to your plan. Don't change it halfway down. I just stick to the plan and go, you know, and make it work. Now, if you got some weather to contend with, you got to move around, try to get a message out, something like that to let, let anybody know. Um, and then know your sky, you know, like I said, study that dark sky map, find out what's out there and around to, uh, uh, you know, plan like, okay, is it going to be a dark area? Do I have horizontal glow or anything like that? You want to do that. And then I also put down, you know, uh, take uh, you take whatever protection and precautions you need to take with you, whether it be, you know, in a, you know, pepper sprays, bear sprays, firearms, whatever the case may be, be prepared in those instances. Now out here, uh, West Texas, I generally will always carry a firearm on my hip uh, when I'm doing photography. Um, if if room permits, I'll carry a long rifle also, just because. Uh, we get wild pigs that can be fairly aggressive and those kind of things you definitely want to be prepared with and know your area and then know the land you're on also um, most land out here if it's not uh, any kind of public access it's private and always get permission to be on the land uh, and i i hopefully it probably won't be anytime soon but I, I may have a possibility of working into a very very nice ranch down in the south of big bend where I'll have access to a, a very large ranch to shoot off of. And I'm really looking forward to possibly that working out materializing. Don't know if it will yet, but definitely something in the future I'm looking forward to. Um, and then always take your supplies, you know, plenty of water, take some food. Uh, like we talked about having the flashlights, uh, you know, have a contingency plan. What if, what if you, what if you roll your ankle out there in the dark, um, you know, Daniel did that very thing on the very first Seeking Darker Skies video we did where he, he made a wrong step and he rolled his ankle and that made for a rough night for him and a rough couple of weeks because it was a pretty bad one. But, you know, if you're out there by yourself, I, 
I like being by myself sometimes, but it's always helpful to have a buddy with you, somebody that just you guys can support each other off of. And plus, share gear, you know, I mean, you can have always have that aspect. Now, um, and then uh, if, you're, if you are hiking in, you know, know your hike, you know, make sure you've done your research. I always like to at least day trip it if you can in the day. Pick a spot you want, mark it, or do whatever you got to do on the trail to kind of know, hey, this is where we were at. This is the spot I want to set up at you, and know the surroundings during the day and then come back at night. That helps a lot with just knowing where you're at and what's around you because you could set up, you know, somewhere not so nice, you know, whether it be oh, like a an animal trail or an animal den, you wouldn't even know it at night, but in the day, the clear as day that, you know, there's something there that you want to avoid. So definitely plan around those things. And, I, and if you can, if time permits, do it in a day scout without your gear, you know, just go in light, get, get your bearings. Yeah. The other option is if you know you're in a very remote area and uh, you can actually pack in during the day and set up, and stay or you can pack it in if it's depending how far away if it's just a mile or two from your car you can pack in leave some stuff come back so you're not carrying as much back or you know figure it out that way and if you're going to camp by the car camp in the car you go back in the morning get your gear or stuff you can do stuff like that that help make it a little safer too so you're not putting so much pressure on on your hike so those are the kind of things that you want to be aware of um and the last tip of this of course is check check your gear right before you start out so if you've packed it all up it's all in the car you're, you're going to grab your bag don't just grab your bag and start hiking stop sit down pull your gear out make sure you have everything ready that night you're going to do take a couple test shots make sure it's, everything's working because there's nothing worse than of course hiking in and realizing you don't have a memory card you don't have your battery uh, that's the bad as probably showing up to a wedding without that stuff but Definitely always do one last run through your gear before you hike in to your location because some of these spots, like I said, can be very remote, takes a lot of time to get to, and you want to be make sure you're you're 100% ready to go when you get there. So if you have any questions on any of that, um, feel free to hit me up on it. And uh, let's see, I think that covers everything in my notes. I pretty much yep, went over it all. So, yeah. Cooley says it would be cool if you had night vision goggles. Yeah, you know, I have a, that would be cool to have like a helmet you can wear with the night vision goggles on it and, and be able to see everything really well. Uh, that's another reason why I like using the red light when I'm out there because, uh, okay, I'm going to go on a rant about Sony right now. Sony, if I was ever to switch brands, it would be the Nikon because the illuminated buttons. Sony does not have illuminated buttons on their cameras. And when you're doing night photography, it would be so awesome to see what button you're hitting. So you got to really use your memory, which ones are where. But that's one thing that Sony hasn't done and they need to really get done is put some dang illuminated buttons. they got illuminated buttons on every other device they've ever made. In the car radios, the stereos, everything's got illuminated button, not the dang cameras. So i got a box full of remotes that got illuminated buttons in them. Where's the, where's the cameras? Uh but you want to not be using your white light. You want to use this red light. The reason why is red doesn't affect your eyes uh, as much as white light. So if you're in the dark situation, you want this red light shining on everything because it won't, you know, it, it leaves your pupils dilated. So it doesn't kill your vision, at, your night vision, basically. Because once you're out there in the dark, you'll be surprised how much light's coming in off all these stars and that you can actually start seeing the ground once your eyes adjust and to it. But the second you turn on a white light, your eyes go, psh, like turning the bedroom light on in the middle of the night. Boom. Oh, geez, you know, you can't see. So definitely want to have uh, a light that goes red because you don't get that effect. That's why you'll see uh, pilots or like even in cars, you'll run red lights in the, in the cockpit so you can see everything because it doesn't affect your night vision out into the dark with the red light blowing around you. So that's one of the other reasons why you'll want to run the red light. The green light works too. It has a similar effect, but it's to me, it's a little bit brighter. There are instances I believe you can use the green light, but uh, I, I prefer the red. So, and always also, you know, don't kill yourself when you turn it on. Make sure you're covering it up when it's on your forehead that you turn it on and then you get to your red before you flash everything um i do use some lights for like light painting so as we mentioned before doing the star shot you know with the beam of into the sky using a high-powered flashlight like this uh you do that that beam shot but 
you'd be surprised if you're light painting, this would almost overexpose it. So you want to play with your image, take a couple test shots. And then really all you need is like, if you had a rock pile, say, or, or a tree you want to light up, all you would do is go, and that's it. And that's like a 20 second exposure. That's all the light you would need to illuminate that tree well enough for your image. Now, if you go back and watch that bucket shot video I have, I use light painting with the Rotolite Neos, or I put them up along the bank, and I'm running those lights as low as they'll go at 1%. And naked eye, once your eyes adjust, you can kind of see everything, but in the video and on the photos, everything's just lit up like daytime at that 1%. It doesn't take much on a long exposure for that 1% to really soak in, and it's a nice, even, cool light so it's, uh, that I like. Uh, it's a true 100%. I missed where that was at. Uh, what will the preferred setting ISO shutter for an F4 aperture? Love the beam shot. Okay, so setting wise, you're going to want an F4, I would start at 6400 ISO and a shutter somewhere around 20 to 25 seconds. And that'll get in a lot, nice little bit of light. And that's 24 millimeter or wider. If you're shooting anything more, you're going to be cutting it after 24 millimeter, you get to 35, that range of 50, you want to be 10 to 15 seconds. And that's to control your star movement and your blur. But you can go faster if you bump your ISO, you just get a lot more noise due to your image with your stars. I'm on, on a roll tonight. We've got four of you guys here. So if you're here and you haven't liked the video already, please go down and hit that like button. It's much appreciated. And uh, play with it. You, I, my starting point with my 24 at F14 is 3200 for about 20 seconds. That's usually my sweet spot on this camera. 3200, I can clean up. This was, a, I believe, this shot was either 2500 or 3200. Um, and, you know, I was able to clean it up very, very well. So it, you've got to just play with it. That's a good starting point. With an F4 aperture, you'd definitely be probably in the 6400 to get your shutter speed down. But it's more than doable. And like I said, I've done it. You won't get an image like this. Uh, it definitely takes some, some dark, dark skies, some clean skies, not just dark, but also clean. And also uh, have, um, like I said, a fast piece of glass. But an F4 is possible. F3.5, no problem. I mean, you can shoot f5.6, and like I said, this is where you can, you can actually, where do you want to put your money at? You, know, you want to just take pictures of stars and not the foreground elements. Well, that's, you spend your money on a tracker, you can shoot an f8, at, you know, as many times as you need to, and you'll get, you'll get a nice image because it's just letting the time soak in with the camera. The problem is with long sh longer shutters is those stars are constantly in motion and you'll blur. So this was, like I said, shot 24. There's not too much motion blur in it. Uh, and that's that's where that sweet spot is uh, for me anyways. I, I think I've gone 30 or into bold mode or longer, but it, 20 to 25 at 3200 is a really nice, good spot at F14 to get the detail. And you, gotta, and, and you need that higher ISO. You can't shoot ISO 100 because it's just not sensitive enough for that light. You've got to have your ISOs bumped up because that lets that camera sensor just grab that light data and bring in this detail and you work it in post there's a lot of work you gotta do in post but you'll be surprised what you're seeing when the camera out there versus what's in the sky you'll be just like holy cow there it is you know and, uh, it's it's a lot of fun I, that's one of the things like i enjoy the most about photography is this stuff uh versus i didn't know you you just need a quick burst of light for light painting thanks yeah that's uh pretty much all it is you play with it you know you can you can splash your light real quick and that's it and i always kind of do it at the end of my shutter i let everything soak in nice and dark and then you know kind of keep 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 a count in your head of your shutter time and just go just flash it real quick and if you need a little bit more or you missed a spot you know you just kind of flood it out and, and run it um, sometimes what i'll do with the headlamp and uh, usually you're pretty safe to keep it in your hand like this uh, for your image and and right at the last second you just flood everything and then you, you Cup it back up, close it. You can do that. You can do that too, and it'll it'll work out good. Smash that like. Yes, please hit the like button. That's a, a must for us out here. So let me go ahead and open this up to anybody who wants to join in. Oh, Robert says you weren't feeling too good. I'm more than understand on that, sir. And uh, but if if you want to join in on tonight's live stream, uh, click the link in the in the comments. 
and it'll open up StreamYard and you'll be able to get in and join join live with me and have a conversation and say hi to the room. And it's a, it's a fun way to connect. So any other questions on astrophotography? So my my plan, uh, I, I said also, I guess one thing is a tripod. I, I briefly touched on it. Got have a tripod. Um, really, the tripod selection comes down to uh, what you can afford. There's $600 lightweight carry models I'd love to have to, to hike in on uh, that are nice and durable tripods. That they they'd get the job done, but uh, at $600, uh, I'd rather buy a Star Tracker. Um, this little tripod from Small Rig right here, the Selection Tripod, it's a very cheap, affordable tripod, about 60 bucks online. It has a lot of features and benefits to it. It's telescopic. It can be switched out into a monopod. Um, it's just a great all-around everything tripod. If you haven't seen this one, uh, I've got it kind of extended up here for the, for the camera to sit on. But uh, tall, nice, long legs. And um, like I said, you can pull this stem out. It turns into a monopod on one of the legs. And it's also got, this is kind of important out there in the dark, this little hook on it. Let me get into the camera range here. This little hook. You can hang your camera bag from it. So once you have all your gear out and you're zipping your camera bag up to keep the bugs and stuff out of it and snakes, you, uh, you hang your camera bag on this. And what that does is it'll add weight to the camera tripod, stabilizing it further. So that's another key benefit to it. And then when you do hit the shutter, I run the two-second uh, timer uh, on the camera. So let me get this turned on here. We, gotta, we go down into, wow. I'm going to get through. You can maybe see it. Uh, yeah, I was shooting Milky Ways uh, on Saturday night um, in the general area where I was uh, where it was going to be this weekend. All right, so what you're going to do on this one, um, left uh, cursor wheel by default, you've got your, your shooting modes, you got your single shot. I know you probably can't see this because it's so small. Go down to the two-second timer, turn it on. That way, once you have your focus and everything set on the camera, you push the button, it gives the camera a second to stabilize, locking it down further on the tripod. Because you can see this tripod, I, I don't have it exactly set up all the way wide here in the studio, but it's definitely something you want to do is have that, that timer clicking away so it stabilizes. All right. Please welcome. So you're not using like a uh, uh, like a shutter release, like because on the Nikon's they have the ones where you plug in and then basically you can just you know fire it off. I I've I've done that. The Sony's also have a cool feature on them, um, and I think it's turned off on this one right now because I had to, it's an app. It's a well, these earlier Sony cameras had an app you could put in that was uh, uh, touchless shutter, and because it uses that sensor that tracks your eye up to the viewfinder and switches the viewfinder from mm -hmm. screen to viewfinder, it yeah. would actually, you could cover it with your hand and it would detect it and it would click the shutter for you. Um, so that was a feature they had early on. I don't know if the newer cameras have it. I haven't uh, had a newer camera really to try it on to see if they, cause they got rid of that app program. And I don't know if that's something they, they still offer out there or not, but mm -hmm. uh, that was a cool feature these cameras had back in the day. Uh, I do have a shutter remote, also the cable, and they, they can be handy for definitely time lapse. I have to run it on that camera because it does have a built-in intervalometer. But uh, but yeah, that's my tip is the two-second timer. So I wonder what night vision goggles cost. Because that was to me that'd be kind of cool to have. If, if if anything, just you know, of course you see somebody walking around at night vision. <laughs> <laughs> it's like hello. So what? One of the one of the uh, motor uh, as a, the YouTubers I follow. It's not photography. It's a fabric uh -huh. out of Utah. They they just went up to uh, this place where they drove off roading in their trucks with night vision goggles, and he was blown away at how well he could see in pitch black in it, black with, with these night goggles in front of him, and you know enough to drive a car, you yeah. know off road. Oh, wow. So I, yeah, it'd definitely be cool to go hike in with some thermals on. <laughs> But uh, but yeah, that would be that would be something else. And uh, let's see. Yeah, that pretty much covers me up for everything I got going. Other than uh, the only other piece of 
gear I don't show is, uh, of course, the sidearm. <laughs> See, now I have a, uh, what is it? Um, not Sony, what I'm thinking of. Um, anyway, it's it's a 14, 14 to 24, uh, 2 8. So I would, I don't, that's not really even fast enough to do what you're doing. Is oh, it? no, it's 2 8. You can definitely get some results on 2 8. I'm going to test 2 8 out on the 16 millimeter lens, which I'm filming on currently. Uh, it's uh -huh. a little pancake lens. The, uh, it's going to be, I, I've, I've shot 2 8 even on that one. And while the results aren't nearly as good as 1 4, uh, it's more than doable, especially in a really dark situation where you got a lot more star detail coming in through the lens. The, um, like I said, that, that Bortle class 10 to 1 scale is so important with it to make sure you're in that class 3 or below for for decent. Well, 4 to 2 is decent. I should say that. 4 to 3 is decent stars in natural photography. 2 to 1 is just incredible, especially if you get into the dead thick of 1. I mean, it's it's dark, and the sky is just it's almost like there's lights on you. It's so that, that's because you're so used to the darkness. And then you look up and the, these stars are just so bright in your face. And it's amazing. Just the difference oh. of getting out of a, a small town and going into the pitch black one and how that difference in the intensity of the light of the stars is. Hmm. I, mean, I would love to go back in time and see that, you know, yeah, Robert says, I had to head out, learned a lot about Astro. Thanks. Yes, Robert, thank you for stopping by tonight. Really appreciate it. Hope you get feeling better. And uh, definitely uh, go check out his channel, Robert Silver Photography. And he does live uh, Thursday nights at 5 p.m. Pacific. Yeah. yeah if you still are here, Robert, uh, I, I, I shot you an email today. So... Yeah, it definitely is something uh, something I've always enjoyed doing. That's been my my passion of it. Robert, See, thank I, you, I, I've gone out there and basically yes. done the uh, night photography, but of like buildings at night. Like I, mm -hmm. I went up to uh, it was Crown Point, their courthouse on Christmas time. They go like full full crazy on the Christmas lights. Right. So you photograph it. It looks like a Christmas card. So I'm like, oh, right. I'm out there. I go there at like three o'clock in the morning. I made sure it was a full moon and basically threw the camera up on a tripod. Got, and I had, instead of using like the cable release, I used the, uh, there's like a remote fire you can get for, for Nikon. So I yeah. was using that as the cable release to, to fire the camera. Okay. And then I even got a little bit of the streaks of snow and the exposure. Oh, yeah. To the yeah. And, uh, I mean, I, and I posted on Facebook, and they went, like, nuts over it. I was like, okay, I guess it's okay, <laughs> you know? I mean, right. I don't know. Yeah, it's it definitely is a uh, um, – yeah, I love Christmas lights, you know, shooting night. The, the problem mm -hmm. I have with Christmas lights is you get the – the image comes out very – purple bluish in the totality of the christmas lights because yeah. they're all blending into that one color in the image and what your eyes perceiving uh -huh. whereas when you're closer you get or by naked eye you get the more independent specks of lights and i haven't been able to figure that out in camera how to duplicate and replicate that without dropping your exposures and just killing them you know so that's definitely huh. the hard thing because you get a blended white light kind of from all the multicolored lights uh, in the camera lens. See, what I did, I don't know if this would work in Astro, is uh, shoot everything HDR. So what I do is I do like five or seven exposures. Then I, I put them all together in Lightroom. And then so you have good density as far as shadows. The, the highlights and the Christmas lights aren't too, too bright. And you get the sky detail and all that stuff too. So, yeah, the uh, um, the problem with HDR with stars is they they're moving. Yeah. Um, and they try and, to line and, them. and and, and low exposure images don't help you really. They don't really give you any detail to work with because everything's so dark already. So, uh, but there are stacking programs out there. You can use stackers and oh, excuse me talking so fast getting all the air uh you get uh 
what was the program I used for the Neowise comment? It was um, it's a free one online that will just stack your astro images, huh. but it lines up all your stars so that it, you know if you don't have a tracker, you can just take a bunch of pictures and it'll line up all your stars for you, and it reduces the noise in the image uh, when you do that, and you can get a pretty decent image with it. But you can definitely tell there's a not quite a perfectness to it, I guess you know. Hmm. But it works. It works really well. Uh, other other than that, um, the uh, but the star tracker, you know, with the star tracker, you can just let the camera sit there and do a hundred exposures at thirty seconds each, or you know, vary your you know f eight or f eleven even, and just let that sensor just soak in for two minutes if you wanted. And that's how that's those are how that's how you capture the images of like the Andromeda Galaxy. And that's one of my goals is to try to be able to, to get that. Um, cause I, let me see if I can find it. It's amazing how big Andromeda galaxy is in our night sky. Um, I have a picture of it shot at 24 millimeter. Now, I don't know. Let me, let me, let me just do this real quick since it's just us now. It looks like, um, find this image. I thought I had a 24 millimeter shot of the of a moon. I know I do. No. Oh, come on, where are you at? Well, anyways, 24 millimeters on the moon is it makes a pretty small moon in the sky. Yeah, um, it's not that big, you know. It, it, in the image, uh, I don't have anything here to. I thought I had one. Oh. But it, it it almost looks like a small star or a, a very large bright star compared to the rest of them at 24 huh. millimeter. It's 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 like wow, that's that's the moon right now. I mean, it doesn't seem like it's. It's right, but that's that's the way it looks. Um, but anyways, let me. I know I saw it looking earlier. Uh, oh, here I think you got the. Okay, yeah. So here's here's a shot of the the moon at twenty four millimeter. Um, I like this shot because it looks like you're on like a spaceship. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, here, let me, uh, let me get it up there. Oh, yeah. Man. So th this is the, the moon was, was, was <laughs> wasn't quite full, but that's what the moon, moon looks like at 24 millimeter in the night sky. That's cool. Okay. So it's, it's fairly small. So, you, you know, you do a 200 millimeter image on the moon and let me pull that up. Oh, what is that building anyway? That's the Reunion Tower in Dallas. Wow. So I'm pretty sure that's a cropped in 400 image. That's cool. Uh, cro cropped in a little bit. Okay, here's the 400 during the eclipse. This this is what's what's cool about shooting the eclipse when they happen on the moon, is you get star detail behind it. Huh. And this is shot, of course, at uh, what was that lens of f four five to five six at four hundred. So this is at four hundred millimeter at five six probably. Mm -hmm. um, so you get you get you get star detail in the image when you when you're getting that kind of time frame in cool. in on it. Uh, but uh, I have a really clean one. I shot with the two hundred two eight. I'm trying to find. I, I know I have from it. Let 
these are shot through a telescope with the A7R2 attached to it. Huh. So I got Saturn. Oh, that's, that's not a star show, photo. The, uh, the Swan Nebula, the Swan's upside down with the beak and head and the body floating. Um, definitely not the clean optics like a regular camera lens, but you get some detail out of it. There's a, this is, you know, pitch black, of course. The moon was up. That's just the moonlight lighting. Oh, you can't even see it. Jeez. <laughs> I forget I which monitor I'm on here. Uh, so, yeah, this is the... Um, this was that setup I had with the telescope, uh, with the camera on the back of the telescope. Oh, that's cool. And, and then uh, just this, just full moonlight on the ground here, lightening everything up. Wow. So. Uh, what time of night was that? Uh, it was right, uh, probably an hour and a half, two hours after sun, uh, moonrise. So probably 10, 11 o'clock at night. Oh, okay. Uh, wow. Where you shot that in the morning? Yeah, that's the tri triflid nebula. That was shot through the telescope. Hmm. Uh, that Swan Nebula again. There's the Swan Nebula. So this, the Swan Nebula is this, this like upside down swan. Hmm. Um, and then I don't. Know, I guess I didn't put Saturn up there for you. Under Saturn. Holy crap. Uh, let's see, it's this one. And well, today I booked four weddings, and they wow. all put their, they all put their payments in through Zelle, and I really, really like Zelle. Zelle is my friend. <laughs> I like I like Zelle just because it goes through the main bank. Yeah. Um, all right, let me find this image. Well, that's good, though. Here's the Orion Nebula shot at 200 millimeter. Oh, wow. Okay, so that's that's the Orion Nebula there in, in the leg of Orion. Um, here's what it looks like at 100 millimeter. It's this little blue speck up here. Oh, wow. So, you know, 200 millimeter gets you out there pretty dang close um, for for this. But, look, okay. I've got I've got to still organize. I have all my pictures now. I just got to organize all my pictures now. <laughs> I got to do that, too. I got I, troubles. I got about uh, five or six, uh, like seven or eight, eight terabyte, you know, six terabyte external hard drives and i've been meaning yeah. to just go through them all and organize them better you know right do i have it in my after photos no yeah this is lightroom finals This a folder here. I'll find it. Dang it! Can I just looked at it? I saw it tonight. Even I was like, "Oh, that's not that's not the right one." Here's the super. Here's the 200 millimeter shot. This was a really clean image I got with the the 200 2.8. Oh wow! So you got a lot more star detail in that one. So that's the moon at 200 millimeter. That's that's what I was looking for here. I'm going to find this thing, dang it. Well, I really want to show you my image, dang it. Ah, here it is. Ah, even it's named Andromeda. Okay, so this is what I shot of Andromeda. Now you're not going to see it right away. You have to maybe get close to the monitor. But let 
This little pixel blip is Andromeda Galaxy. That's okay. Cool. And that's shot at 24 millimeter. So you can see that whole cloud is bigger than the moon was. And this image. Huh. Okay, it's it's about it's about like that, you know, it's it's, it's like that in the sky at, at two at two uh when you compare the two. So you know that's that's where it's at. So this won't be my image, but let me see if I can find it because there's some really awesome. Images of it shot at 200 millimeter uh, that are, are definitely worked a little bit. And of course, I don't know if they cropped or anything like that, but I'm just looking for one I kind of recognize here. I will just use the Wikipedia image. I don't know who's who's it belongs to, but. another window new window so with a star tracker you can get something like this i pull this off wikipedia well so you see that that's that's probably cropped in at 200 millimeter but what's what's there's some really clean images if you research it of this is another galaxy further back and then so is this one over here there so you get a cluster of three galaxies in one image and like I said, they say this is about uh, four moons in our night sky will fit in this area of space uh, in our, it, it, from our perspective in our night sky. So four moons across is how wide this. So if you're looking up in the sky at a full moon, four of those stretched across each other would be how big this actually is in our night sky. And it's 44 million light years away or something. So, uh, <laughs> and that's that little speck right here. And it's a seasonal thing too. When you go to shoot this one, you got to shoot it. Um, I think it's more midsummer this August. It's further north. This is facing north. Uh -huh. This is the tail of the Milky Way uh, coming overhead as it as it moves from south to north. So you don't have a lot much detail in it. And then, of course, we're looking north where all the light was. You get all this yellow banding of light in the horizon versus the, where the other image is going directly south. Or I have no, no light south, so it's very dark. But you can get this when it's, I think it's uh, winter time or early spring. It's, it's more directly overhead, and you can, you can get a, a star tracker and get it locked on and get a couple hours worth of shots of it. You stack it all together, get your detail, and and make it make it work. Wow. So definitely one of the to dos for me, and what I want to do is get that done. So, so uh, you got some oh, over here. No, not that one. Let's see that one. All right. So you got weddings planned, huh? Yeah. They found me, I didn't find them, which was kind of weird, but, you know. Especially so many at once, huh? Yeah. Well, it was like, basically this morning, I I, I talked to two people, and uh, the first one says, well, you know, we don't have to discuss. You know, it was weird. It was act like there was no worry about price and what I was going to charge them, you know, so. What's your uh, what's your go-to setup for a wedding? As far as equipment or, or yeah, your camera lens choices. Well, I I've got three uh, D750 full frames. Yeah. But I've got uh, I have one camera. I, I I'm probably the only human left on Earth that uses them still. I've got a, it's it's a strobo frame, and basically what I do is I take the strobo frame and I flip it around backwards. That way I can mount it to my camera, and basically it puts my flash above camera so i can do vertical i just want to do vertical i do this way and flip the flash up here 
I want to do horizontal, I just flip it down there and hold it right. there. But by putting it on backwards, I can still grip my uh, vertical grip and the shutter release when I'm shooting, you know, vertical. It's kind of cool. I got like three or four of them. I didn't realize. <laughs> But I have like, I, I keep like on one side, I have like a, I have a, a 70 to 200, 28. That's my available light camera. And on the other side, I have hanging from my shoulder is a, the strobe frame with a uh, 24 to 70. So I have a pretty much a giant range of lenses between the two, you know, all, all the way from 24 to 200. So, so th this is, this is, uh, this is you when you're, uh, when you're at a wedding, yeah. <laughs> Maybe one less camera. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, but right. I have the, the third body sitting in there. And if, sometimes if I, if I want to do something like super wide, I have the, the 14 and 24 on that one. Uh, you ever you ever get on Instagram and watch those short videos or anything like that? Yeah. Have you seen the guy who uses the gimbal with his light in a backpack? And... You know, oh, he, he, right. he rotates his, he wrote, he's got like, it's like an 8,700 or, or whatever on a, on a gimbal and it lifts up. He's got the, the little like two foot soft box on it and it's, it sticks up over his head and rotates around oh, yeah. different shots. Well, there was one guy that did, he has these like custom uh, frames for his camera. And what he does is, I don't, you ever see the 80, those 8,200s? Mm -hmm. He'll mount this on top of there. They only have a transmitter here that you know fires to the to the flash. So the 200 watt second flash with a vanilla head on front of it, which means it's like a 40, 40, 45 angle like uh, a view off of the flash. Yeah. And uh, I'm just thinking to myself, man, I thought I was bad, you know. <laughs> Well, the thing I I, I I hate about one of the, the last things I didn't talk about for my my astrophotography trip that I'm packing is I'm taking all my my little studio lights. So I've got this one behind me that's on the ceiling, and then I've got my three in my softbox. I got to break all this stuff down and pack it up to take it with me because mm -hmm. I use them as environmental lighting. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, yeah, I gotta, I gotta get that all. That's the only reason why I haven't packed it yet is because I needed it for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That I don't have anything recorded for this week's video, so probably won't pack it tomorrow night. I'm only gonna film uh, my setup here, and this is gonna be my how-to, my next video. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, sneak peek into my next, what my next video is gonna be is gonna be my how-to live stream. Uh, and how I got my live stream set up going. So that's going to be, uh, gonna I got to, cool. I got to leave it set up to film that. And then once that's done, I can tear it all down. Yeah. So, and then I got a couple days to edit that. Cause once I, if it's not up by Thursday night, ready for Sunday morning release, then, uh, uh, it probably ain't going to happen. Cause I'll be gone until late Sunday. <laughs> that's cool. But there's a, uh, like, this Sunday, we're take we're going with Angelina. She's gonna have her like I guess you'd call it her indoctrination into Indiana University, Bloomington. That she's that's where she's going. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the way is a deserted, allegedly haunted uh, sanitarium. Nice. And I'm like, hmm. I, I mentioned the rose. She's like. <laughs> I think I lost her. I think I lost her. Ghosts. <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd, I'd be, I'd be down for that one. I'd, oh, I'd, be, I'd jump yeah, right I'd, into those things. Well, here's a weird thing. Years and years back, I, I think at the time, I had Fuji S3 Pros, this 12 megapixel camera, and but it takes all the Nikon lenses. So I had like a, a 20 millimeter lens on there. I think it was, mm -hmm. and with with no flash. And I was just basically taking pictures, 360 all the way around me. And the, the lady said in this graveyard that you'll you'll see like orbs sometimes. 
well, you know what I did? I saw two orbs. I'm like, hmm, I think I'm leaving now. <laughs> it was like weird, like distortion kind of like, I don't know. I'm like, yeah, my, uh, I just think she cranked up my imagination too hard. <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Oh gosh. Uh, yeah, my, uh, I got, I, I had a few ghost experiences over my life, I guess, but, uh, my well, most recent that, and most, yeah. <laughs> my my most recent and most real one was at my 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 job I'm at, and in our building, it's an old building, and yeah. you know it's it's been around a long long time, <laughs> but True. at night if you're the last one in that place, like I <laughs> I don't mind going down there at twelve or one o'clock in the morning, but it's not preferred. <laughs> um, but what happens if you if you're working there late and say you're the last one there and you're working in the shop and everything gets dark around you, uh, the building makes a lot of damn noise. God dang, does it make noise? I mean, there's there's shit moving that you shouldn't be moving. <laughs> you uh -oh. know, uh -oh. just 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 noises. And I think all it is is the building cooling off from the long yeah. hot day. Yeah. But there's there's loud bangs moving. There's uh, doors will shut. Um, you know, there's stuff that's just a little unnerving, but the, the most realistic thing that's happened to me is I was clocking out, I was in the office, and where the, there's an office like room that can hold a bunch of desks, say, uh, along uh, a, a, call, a, a corridor hallway where the time clock is. I clocked out, and then you walk across this room, and then there's a long corridor hallway about maybe 30 feet. Going to the next set of offices, and there's doors off of this corridor for other offices. Uh -huh. I walked around that corridor, looked down that hallway, and saw somebody walking past. And I said, Hey, what's up? Yeah. Ain't nobody there. But I saw yeah. that somebody move past, at, you know, where the other front door would be into the next office, like in this, mm -hmm. you know, 30 feet down, clearly enough to say, Hey, what's up? Thing and somebody came in to do a call out or somebody there late for some reason. And yeah, it was just me. Doors were locked. Oh, shit. <laughs> but <clears throat> yeah, that's uh that was enough time for me. I was like, okay, shut these lights off. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Boom because you're moving so fast. Yeah, right. But yeah, it's like being out in the in the wilderness at night, you know, with all this like through the stars doing stuff like that, and you're sitting there by yourself in the cabin, and you're just like, mm. "What the hell was that?" <laughs> it's like I don't want my shutters open. I can't push the flashlight on yet. <laughs> <laughs> you better not have any light on you. <laughs> yeah, we're cooling. <laughs> Missing my exposure, Mister. Oh. Got my exposure. I turn the flashlight on. Okay, my shutter closed. Oh, who is there? <laughs> no, that's where you carry a little, little container of holy water. You go take that and that. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. <clears throat> no, that didn't bother me too much being out there. It's uh, um, I only worry about like you know stepping on a damn snake or something getting bit. That's the only thing I really worry about. Yeah. I'd be worried. I'm more worried about getting eaten by wolves or something or a bear. Yeah, that would be problematic, I guess, if you had that stuff around you. We got the damn pigs, and they'll charge at you if they feel threatened. They got those tusks on them, man. Yeah, See, they're 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 open season all year here. You can you can take them out anytime. Oh, See, it's, me and my cousin went wild boar Arkansas Razorback, Arkansas Razorbacks, and Arkansas. We went boar hunting out there, man, and we we actually got chased up a couple of trees one time. <laughs> Jeez, oh, and you know what? You find out how fast you can climb a tree. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's uh, definitely is. Comes to the next tree says, "Shoot him! Shoot him!" <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they. Uh, they definitely. That's the only the only big. Big thing you gotta worry about it here. You know, mountain lions are scary. They they can stalk you or do something, but 
Yeah, I, I remember we were, we were hiking back from the Neowise hike. We were hike we had we hiked in probably a little over a mile. And it was a common hiking trail during the day. It's nothing to hike this little loop, but at night it's a whole different ball game. But um, coming back off, we saw a pig got like twenty feet from us on the on the trail. I'm like, god damn it, <laughs> what's freaking pigs? But those situations, I'm already. I'm already holding. I'm like ready. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, I got, this, I've got this thing going right here, man. <laughs> I'm like, all right, where are you at? <laughs> You're gonna die. <laughs> yeah, but, but it's fun. But this oh. place where I'm, where I'm getting my shot this weekend, it's right next to the house. <laughs> Just gotta turn all the house lights off. There you go. That's not too, not too bad. So. Yeah, I've never looked. The trouble is, though, I've got so many solar powered lights on my deck now. <laughs> All the little I'm, pillar lights. I'm like, I'm like the definition of of uh, uh, of too much ambient light. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, you can actually shoot. You can shoot the stars in in a city. And get good detail. You you got to run the uh, an infrared sensor or infrared filters on your camera. Oh, okay. Huh. And it kills all the other light visible light spectrum that floods the light, and you can get full star detail. Hmm. The image has just come out red. That's the only problem. I'll never forget me and uh, Melanie, my oldest daughter. Uh, they were saying how uh, <clears throat> I guess Earth was going through a. Big thing of different like uh, meteorites and stuff. So we literally grabbed some pillows, got the the uh, the, the chairs, reclined them all the way where all we could see is up, mm -hmm. and we sat there for like an hour, hour and a half, watching shooting stars going. Choo, 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 choo. It was it was so cool. Yeah, we we that's what we tried doing this weekend was because we had that percent meteor shower going on. Yeah. And uh, every August when we pass through this comet's dust trail or whatever. So uh -huh. we were we were down a few hours south and it's a pretty dark town, a little, little tiny, you know, 2200 people town. But um, you could see the Milky Way down, you know, in town at the park. We could see it. But we drove out uh, about 20 minutes out of town to where it was really dark. And uh -huh. it's amazing the light difference, you know, but we... I think the kids finally saw one, they said, one shooting star uh, when we were in town. Uh, but uh -huh. we didn't, when we were out in the dark, we didn't see anything. We were there about five, ten minutes. We were staring at the sky and nothing. Nothing at all yeah. came up. So that kind of kind of sucked. But we'll see it this weekend. It's supposed to be still going this weekend and how many will flood my image and screw it up. That's cool. Yeah, this weekend we had an air show. I just didn't feel like going. <laughs> I've been wanting to go back to the one we have here. The first year I was here, we had the Blue Angels, and they haven't been back since. And the Blue Angels are always always cool to go see. Yeah. But we always had the little guys coming in, and they're just not, they don't pull the crowds and toward my interest as much. But, um, but yeah, this, this, I don't know, maybe this year I'll get out there with the, well, I, I don't have my, uh, I don't own my 100 or 400 anymore. And, even though I can I can borrow it anytime so I can get it, but it's just I don't have it anymore. So I don't think of doing that kind of shooting. Hmm. I got a three hundred F four. Yeah, I'm waiting for I want a three hundred two eight. If they make if Sony releases it, I'm sure they will. Because they have it in their old Minolta mount, um, the A mount that you can get the three hundred two eight. Uh -huh. But um but you know, I figure by the time they release one for the E mount, it's going to be probably six or seven thousand dollars. But that would be one lens I think I would want would be a three hundred two eight, and mainly for astrophotography purposes, and put it on this tracker. You know, get get a Ryan's Nebula three hundred millimeter, you know, on a long stacked exposures. At uh, KEH, they have a uh, used. 200 to 500 5.6 and it's like i want to say it was like 800 some dollars for this lens i'm like hey bad and then i mm. found a uh, um i don't know i've been kind of jonesing after uh 
the that I know it's only an F4, but uh, that 24 to was it 120 F uh, F4 lens, but they have an F mount for Nikon, so. Oh, nice. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking that'd be a nice little second secondary lens for uh, uh, doing available light stuff or something. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I got like an 85 uh, 18. I love. Oh my gosh, I'm dying tonight. Uh, my 85 one four is really good at it. Mm -hmm. Does some great star astrophotography. It's just you gotta just be quick at that that focal length. Yeah, because the shorter it was, like a little bit short, longer the focal length, the more it exaggerates the. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it works. It's just you gotta just plan to shoot at a higher ISO and cut your shutter time in half. But the one four helps do that. You get away with a lot, but it's not like the shooting twenty four where you can let it soak in for twenty twenty five seconds to get a nice clean image. Mm -hmm. What I what I what I'd like to see them do, and this is maybe something I should make a video for because I don't think anybody's brought this up, is. Why not use the sensor and the camera to move to track the stars for that 20 seconds? Well, that Z9, no, see, yeah, or, yeah, the Z9 has that thing now where you set up the camera and when you put the camera in a blind and it basically, say a bird lands on a, on a perch and moves around a little bit, it'll automatically track that bird, focus it, and take the picture of it. Oh, really? Wow. I'm like, yeah, one more step and not need photographers anymore. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, they, they've got the sensor technology that does the quarter or the, the pixel shift technology in them where uh, you know, it's newer ones that do it. You know, it'll take four exposures, but it moves the sensor down one pixel to the right one pixel and up one pixel. Huh. So it takes four exposures at the different spots, and it gives you like a 160 megapixel image to work with. Yeah. I wish that kind or somebody would come out with a uh, like a 100 megapixel uh, uh, camera body. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah, it's. I mean, high megapixels cool, but you're getting some data transfer there, man. <laughs> you know, imagine doing astrophotography with. Like that one of those phase one Hasselblads with a uh, was it like a, a 28 or a 24 2 8 uh, distagon mm -hmm. lens that they they make? Yeah, that would be cool. pretty, pretty insane sharpness. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, if you can get the, get the camera locked down enough in the stars, man, you can get some detail. They say the Sony's got that star eater problem where the the noise reduction reductions in the camera, the built-in noise reductions, delete stars because it's thinking it's noise. Ugh. But uh, I've never, and so is on my camera. I think they fixed it in one of the latest firmware updates. But I've never seen like I've had that problem with it. Mm -hmm. And if if I am losing stars, I sure don't realize I am. It looks dang good. But it's amazing if you if you mess around like with that. Each one of them go. What? I'm one short. Wait, there's two shorts. <laughs> yeah, it and that's where that stacking software comes into play because it, it'll evaluate where the stars are in the image. It figures out what those are because it's looking at multiple images, and then it deletes the noise because when you stack the images, it stacks all the stars on top of each other, lines it, and anything that doesn't line up is considered noise, so it denoises the image for you. And hmm. that's the benefit of running long stacked exposures on stars or, or especially in telephoto is you, you can, you, you can delete all the noise because it's easy for the system to go in and, and say, well, these don't line up to anything in all the images. They're, they're all random. It considers it noise and deletes it. So it's one of the benefits to it. Uh, when you, when you have a tracker, you do it. I've done it without just a tripod at point at the stars. You can take multiple exposures of the same spot in the sky and then just go in and stack those images and, and, and peel, peel them all together. Yeah. And that works well, too, just to get some. 
as long as there's no foreground element that's moving around. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to this weekend. We'll see what I can get figured out and if I can get a get a shot or not. Hopefully I get my bucket Are shot. Are you like the wife and the kids and everybody going or just you? That'll be me and my son this trip. That's cool. We got some kind of a guy's trip. Yeah, I'm going down there with the guys from work. It's, it's actually the owner of the company's ranch that I go to, but the, uh, he's got a uh, have a pretty nice little place down there. But we'll go down and do some work, move some equipment around, and we'll drive a big heavy trailer down there and get my son out, out of the house for the summer. One last trip for the summer before the before the uh, the school starts back up. Yeah. I tell you, man, this, the coolest gig ever was uh, with Run into, I ran to a guy. My dad used to race J105 sailboats. He had two of them. One was like a spare. And uh, so anyway, I went to one of his races on the East Coast. They were like just hanging, talking and stuff. This guy comes up and starts. And I had my cameras hanging for me. And he goes, ah, so you do a little photography? He goes, yeah, I've been doing it for you know. I mean, I started shooting weddings at 16. But um, we started talking. Next thing you know, he says, "Hey, you want to, you know, want to tag with me? I'll pay you. Come help me for three months going up the East Coast." So he had a, it was absolutely awesome. He had this giant Winnebago that he towed his his car behind. It he had like a little like a Le Mans or I don't know those little little cars that, that you know two people and you're crowded. Um, but he also had a trailer. That he had, uh, he had like one of those little helicopters. Oh yeah. And he would like he he basically unbutton, it would unclip. He fold the thing open like this. They he roll the blades out, and we take off and photograph boat racing. Wow, that's cool. cool. I mean, I think the guy had more money he knew what to do with, but it was, <laughs> but he had he, the cool thing though is he'd go into his 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 mobile home thing. And print the large prints and sell them right there. Oh yeah, that's cool. I'm like, my my dad's gonna be like, why the hell can't you do that? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I told me, hey, you want to up front me about eight eight hundred thousand dollars? I can do it. <laughs> yeah, right. If I, need, if I need a pilot license. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, there's a guy down here that's got a pretty good sweet gig. His his uh, company um, specializes in um, ranch photography for like the because down here the the hunting is all private. So there's natural wildlife everywhere, but hmm. there's these game reserves down here where you can go and hunt these like epic deer that have like you know twenty points on them or something. And they let you hunt helicopters. Huh. They let you hunt from the helicopter? No, no. He he he. His he's a production company, a photography company that goes out oh, oh. to these ranches for you know. He'll spend a week on a, somebody's property just photographing the animals, and you know he's shooting four hundred two eight six hundred four f fours, and um, he's shooting he's shooting Sony, but uh, he uh, yeah he he's got a full production crew that goes out there for a week and they'll they'll live on this guy's ranch and i mean you're talking you know the full first class you know i mean these these people pay you know five thousand dollars for a ticket to go hunt you know every year you know and you or or more money than that even depending on the package i guess they're buying but they go to pet yeah. to shoot these 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 deer let me see if i can pull up his website I'll show you the deer he's taking pictures of There was somewhere they were letting people hunt from helicopters. Yeah, that's that's a thing down here. You can do pig hunting that way down here. Because the pigs are such a problem down here that they're they're just open season. And even uh, from what I understand from people that are on these ranches, they say you see a pig, you just shoot it. That's 
because there's so many of them that they can be so. Um, <laughs> I like his 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 opener to his, his websites. Fast, cheap, and good. Pick two. <laughs> <laughs> If it's fast and cheap, it won't be good. If it's cheap and good, it won't be fast. <laughs> if it's fast and good, it won't be cheap. That's the truth to that. That sounds like an ad for Billboard. <laughs> I'm going to throw up his website here. Just to, I don't want to. Let's see if I can do this without making. Yeah. Well, that's advertising for him, I guess, if, if you got a problem with it. But these are this kind of images he's oh, shooting wow. this big deer with a multi point or like that. So they they fly in and do those pictures or they No, I think they're just local to Texas and they just go around and do this stuff. Dang. So yeah, they uh they, they, they get paid to go out and make produce videos and make these photos. And I've, you know, if I wasn't so locked out of my job, I'd be calling them up and say, hey, give me an internship. <laughs> Ain't it? But, you know, he's, he's got quite the team. I think he's based out of Boston. Hmm. There was a guy, what was his name, that went all over Texas doing family portraits? It was doing everything on like a four by five view camera. Wow. I mean, some serious, serious. Uh, but his smallest print was like a 30 by 40. It was just, you know, you, you go in there, do your family portrait. Next thing you know, you're dropping 10 or 20 grand. Hmm. I don't know. I wish, wish I had that problem. Right. <laughs> And the funny part, you see these videos these guys do, like how-to videos, and they don't even set their own stuff up. It's like somebody comes in there because everything's set up. He walks in, click. All right, that's a wrap. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. I think if I was the owner, I'd be really, I'd be ticked. Like, I just dropped 20 grand on you, and all you did was click. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, it's, I don't know, it's weird because you can charge, you can literally charge somebody anything. And, and what blows me away is like, even, even myself, you know, is I, I knew cameras. I like taking pictures and I had my wedding photographer we hired and he was, I guess you could say cheaper, but it was still a lot of money to us. It was a $1,500, uh, you know, all day coverage. Yeah. And the thing I liked about him too is after a year, he let you keep all the digital prints. He 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 gave them to you, huh? Um, because I guess sometime in his past he'd been burned by a photographer and lost photos of the family and stuff because he couldn't afford to buy the prints and the photographer deleted everything. So he's like, after a year, I give everything away. But uh, but yeah, you know, I I looking back on him, he wasn't very good. The photography wasn't, uh, you know, we had cut yeah. shadows across our faces in some spots, yeah. and but they're all pictures we ended up liking, you know. So I mean, it, it, we were ha more than happy with the service and what he did and what he provided us. He, I mean, uh -huh. it, it was a good deal, um, you know. Especially looking back at what I would charge now for a wedding, and I have very few weddings under my belt, but for what I know, my time and my I think my quality is worth, and I would would say. Uh, I would charge more than that, you know. Yeah, nowadays but you got to at least start thirty five hundred to make money. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I package myself right now for you know a small wedding video, uh, just to, just a like a highlight five minute highlight video with, you know, it starts around probably two thousand, mm -hmm. and 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 then if they want to do like 
full ceremony coverage, you know, that's an, that'd be an adder or, you know, mm -hmm. I, I'll, I'll usually offer like all day service, like if, if they want, you know, um, but like I said, I've only done a couple. And, There's a video, yeah. video, yeah, videographers in Chicago now, they're charging for like the cheap stuff, $55, you know? And it's like eight hours of coverage. That's all you get. Yeah. Well, it's like I need to get on off my butt and get my drone license and buy a drone because well, it's like $300 just to launch one. Just to show up and I put was, it in the air. I was told that if you don't do it commercially, then you don't need a, a, pilot's, a, a pilot's license. So if you dig through all that, and, and YouTubers have gotten into a lot of trouble because YouTube's commercial. Whether you're making money and you're monetizing on YouTube or not, it's commercial. Huh. And so if you're a YouTuber and you have drone footage, you're supposed to have a FAA Part 107 license for commercial use. And literally, it breaks down to if they say, the FAA says, that you have to have an FAA 107 license to use it to inspect your roof on your private property. But you have to have that license technically by the wording of the law. You, If you're using it, that's like a work you're using it for, not recreation, then you mm -hmm. would have to have that 107 license. So the, really the only thing you could ever do with it recreationally is launch on the up there, go, wee, look at it go, you know, and like watch the camera footage on your controller, and that's it. That's what a recreational license gets you. So the 107 license allows you to, to make money from it or use it in any other manner than that. Hmm. And it's 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 important. I mean, I know they had a lot of problems with them, and, and the fads died off. The only people buying these drones now are the people that want to use them for camera purposes you know when they first came out everybody got one for christmas and there was a thousand drones in the air that morning and it's like <laughs> <laughs> all pumping into each other like oh you no. know or, or you get into the issues where you know planes have struck them you know so passenger airliners have struck them or ingested them uh, you know there's there's, there's major problems are you to be flying your drone that cl a that close well, to the airport that close to a plane you know, I I have I had one for a while, and I got rid of it because I didn't have I don't have my license, and I just I couldn't utilize it, so I ended up selling it to just get you know something more useful for me. But, um, you know, where I'm at, so you're allowed on any drone flight, you're allowed to go 400 feet up maximum altitude. That's it. Uh -huh. And planes aren't allowed to drop low. I think 500 feet. You know, so you have a hundred foot separation from the drones to the planes, mm -hmm. you know, unless you're in the area of an airport. And if you look at it at, at, at flight charts for an airplane, if you look at the map, um, let me draw it out real quick. Airspace is represented like an upside down wedding cake, essentially. And the higher the altitude, the higher the platform goes. So if your airport's down here at the bottom, if your airport's down here, you have a, a round radius airspace that's up to a certain altitude you're not allowed to be in. Mm -hmm. And then outside it to the next tier, you have a certain altitude you're allowed to be in that you're not allowed to be above it because, you know, and then it's it's a tiered system up and out. So that's how, like, airspace works around an airport. Hmm. And modern drones with the computers in them now and the programming, they won't even let you take off near an airport. You can't do it. And uh, I know when I sold mine, uh, the guy wanted to beat me at a spot and I'm like yeah i'll meet you over there and then on the way there i'm like that's like next door to the airport i'm not going to be able to test fly this for him to show him that it works so it wouldn't even spin the props they wouldn't even let me fire it up oh wow 
because I was, and I was, you know, 200 yards from the airport runway, basically, uh, in, in right across the flight path coming in, it wouldn't even let me lift it off the ground there. Mm. And it was an older drone. So, um, at my house here, I could fly it to 400 feet, no problem. But I've, I swear to God, I've seen planes coming into the Odessa air, airport, which is several miles away from me. And they still, uh-huh. they're, I'm like, man, if I was at 400 feet, I'd be worried about hitting them. Yeah. Well, did you see where in the Ukraine, the they're taking drones and make basically making them suicide drones, and they're and the Russians are parking their ships in these, you know, where they park ships and stuff, and they're flying them into the into the the ships. And yeah, I've up. seen that. I've seen that. There was one. It was like. You had three fly in, you see, poof, 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 and all of a sudden the whole thing just goes, like, mm-hmm. you fall fire. You're like, what the heck? Yeah, I've seen some of that footage. There's, yeah, they're, they're using them for all sorts of stuff. They're it's one of the ways of the future, I guess. There was a guy going to use a re- remote controlled car with a C4 on it to ride it underneath somebody's car to blow them up. I'm like, whoa, you know? Yeah. No, and it's amazing how far these drones can go out, even what, what they're giving us, you know. I mean, you can get them out there pretty dang far yeah. before they cause problems. And, when yeah. I was up at the up at the UP, this guy had this one. I kid you not, it would fly away, doing the video and all that stuff. And then if the batteries got low, it automatically turned itself around, came back. Yep. Or and it would automatically any branches that were like in the way, it would go around the branches automatically. You yeah. barely have to do anything. I'm like man. No, so, some of these new ones are they're so advanced that it's it's crazy how well that how well they work. I'm telling you, man, ever since Roswell. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, it won't be long before our cars are drones, that's for sure. Yeah. I just gotta figure out the high the network of highways. But we'll be all strapping into a computer. It'll take us there, put us in line. Yeah. I, uh, what was that one with uh, Will Smith? I, Robot, I think it was just called or something. Remember? Mm-hmm. They had that Audi that was supposedly, actually, they made a, uh, that was the actual uh, uh, prototype. Concept car, yeah, prototype they built. Called, man. I mean, basically, it was just kind of this. Windows, the doors would pull up like this, it, you know, it was just nuts, you know. Yeah, I'm waiting for man when they, they start having them more out. Uh, they came back out with the new Beetle Bus, the uh, uh, the Volkswagen Beetle Bus. All right, they had, they had like a smaller one, which is only electric engine in front, and they've got one that's a little bigger, it's got the two motors, one in the back, one in the front. That's the one I'm gonna get because. Yeah, I mean it's like you literally. The version I saw, you just let you folded the steering wheel into the dashboard, and the seats like rotate. And you just start talking to people like, hey, da, 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 you know, and it just drives itself wherever you want it to go. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's uh, what was the other? It's another movie that was out that had something showing that. I mean, it's not. It, it's a reality now. Cars are already doing it. You know. Yeah. It's only a matter of time. Another ten years. It's a lot more of them going to be doing it. And they're saying like the ones with electric motors, they really don't break down because there's really no moving parts. Uh huh. Oh, so I, 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 I gotta, I gotta bring this up because I've been meaning to ask you about it. What? So after I jumped off Roberts last week, you guys, I went back and rewatched. You know the what I, what you guys talked about for like four minutes. Oh, okay. Uh, Star Trek, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. Oh, it's so you, good. You, uh, have you been following the new uh, Star Trek uh, Strange, the Strange I, Frontier? Strange New Worlds, yeah. Hey, hold on. Yeah. I'm going to welcome. Uh, Last Matthew. Thursday, they had the musical. It was hilarious. Matthew's in the room. What's up, man? Um, what needs to come on live? Yeah, you coming in live, man? Got, I, he's got an FX thirty too. 
<laughs> I know it can happen. Uh, but, if you want to uh, come in, let me know. I'll send you the link. Uh, put it up in the comments again if you can't see it there. Otherwise, we're, we're here, man. Join us. But uh, I'm a I'm a giant. I, I'm not really giant, giant, but I'm a pretty pretty decent size uh, tr- trekkie. I mean, yeah, I like I've, food, I've grown food. up with it. I, I've I've always I've always enjoyed them and loved them. And you know, I've got from a kid, I've got the Enterprise blueprints for the Enterprise D. You know the the best the best the best moment in TV history was episode nine of Picard, uh, season three of Picard, man, when they pulled out the Enterprise D. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, that was the Borg, you know. That was cool. As you say, I watched the first one of a season of Picard. I'm like hey, it wasn't bad. I just watched like the first one of season two. I'm like, eh. and then. I was, then I got the itch, and I went back and I watched all the episodes, and then I watched all the episodes, obviously of uh, the third season, of Picard. I think it's going to be interesting if they do come out with that Star Trek Legacy. Yeah. Yeah. With seven yeah. and nine as the captain and stuff. Yeah, I'm like, that'd be a good one to watch. I bet they would. So that's maybe one day yeah. getting on the live. Uh, you guys hear about the riverboat cruise fight in Alabama? We have, I have not heard about that. So got, about the riverboat cruise fight? Let's see what the news says about that here. Riverboat cruise Alabama fight. Let's see here. Like quite the brawl on the news here. Dang. Yeah, I'm not going to cover anything like that on the channel, but that's that's interesting. <laughs> Went viral today. He says, "Yeah, People I see it." Crazy. They are. Yeah, but no, it's uh. I, I, did you watch? Uh, I don't know when the when it came out, but I watched the latest episode of Strange New Worlds with the with with their singing. Oh yeah, yeah, that was it was kind of <laughs> funny but kind of cool, you know. It was like it was like yeah, this is what the hell's this episode, you know? It's like ah dang, <laughs> and uh, and then they get into the whole first song, and then the last line of Captain's like, "Why am I singing?" It's just like Jesus, <laughs> why am I singing this? Yeah, I'm kind of waiting for him to bring back. Because there's, they're allegedly going to bring back the Gorg. Is that a Gorg? I think I mean the uh, those evil evil lizard people. Oh yeah, from the from the original series. Uh, Matthew asks, are are you guys Marvel fans? I've watched them all. I wouldn't say I'm I'm a diehard fan like I would be yeah. with with Star Wars or Star Trek. Because and the reason why we're talking about it is the ones I dig is like Iron Man. Um, you know, he's pretty cool. Yeah, like I, I really got into the the first. I, I think it's what do they call it? The because my buddy at work, Daniel, who's a feature on the channel, he he's a Marvel fan, and uh, he's um, he's got uh, he's got like the he knows the timelines and all that stuff. And and I I had to go on the internet to tell the internet tell me how to watch the movies because I me and my kids have sat down and watched through all the movies in a row and, and they're really good i really enjoy enjoy the marvel movies but where i've lost interest is in this the multiverse <laughs> stuff oh yeah you got a liar man there <laughs> and then i have i have all pretty much all the star wars stuff i got star uh starship enterprise i've got uh Battlestar Galactic. i got vipers nice uh F fourteen Tomcat with uh, real live wings at work. Oh, cool! Like that, and then they. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I'll bring out the Star Trek toy here. Hold on a second. Roll. <laughs> <laughs> well, Oh, oh, oh. 
this is this is my childhood right here coming. I got these out for my kids. <laughs> we'll start watching Star Trek, but we got the Enterprise, Enterprise D. D. Yeah. Does you know, it have like, where the saucer section separates or no? This one doesn't no, but it's got the warp the warp cells pop off for whatever reason. But they have electrical contacts, they light up, it's got all the noises and put batteries in it. See, that's cool. And uh like I said this one's it's it's an old from when I was a kid. Yeah. And then we got a nice thing all clean on battle cruiser also. Oh, there you go. Now we're talking. So that's that's a fun one. And then we got the the action figure shuttle, you know. <laughs> it actually actually fits like the actual figures in it has a seat in it. You can put I came one night <laughs> I sleep, I was on Amazon. They had the uh, Enterprise D Bluetooth speaker. Oh, I think I've seen that, yeah. And I'm like, hmm. And my wife would kill me. Why are you buying that? <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> Yeah, he says, I was never into Star Trek, but can appreciate others' interest in it. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely one of those things I wouldn't say I'm, I'm not a, I wouldn't say I'm a diehard fan like the, some people have been, but, you know, can be like yeah. a Trekkie. I, I, I appreciate the show. I appreciate the, the, the stories it tells, but I don't yeah. dive into it beyond that. You know, as a kid, I had the toys and stuff. I always kept them over the years. So, me too. Uh, you know, I, I was trying like to. G.I. Joe. Remember GI Joe? Yeah. With the, when they were like this tall. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> like this. <laughs> um, I and I I never, uh, you know, Star Wars was always a cool cool movie. But yeah. I was, you know, when I was a kid, you know, Star Wars was just the original movie. Still, there was no other branch yeah. off. And, and Marvel, they you know, Marvel's done a really good job with with telling the whole Marvel story. But I that was something I never followed as a kid, so I, I've only known it in my adulthood and from the movies. And uh, like I said, I, I kind of they're kind of losing me in the multiverse and the timeline and, and all the different stuff they do yeah. in that. But they have uh, you know, I, I watched the first season of Loki, and I, I enjoyed Loki, and I think the second season's coming out. I'm going to watch that, yeah. but I haven't watched any other like mini series no i take that back i watched the the falcon one i watched that series but i didn't watch any of the other ones that and star wars probably pushed tech innovation though oh yeah absolutely star wars i mean star trek too i swear the those little flip phones came from the uh communicator from star trek you know oh there's there's a there's a documentary out there showing all the technology that they dreamed up that we currently have now yeah and uh yeah the flip phone was one of them you know now we've got tablets you know i noticed in strange new worlds they've got basically their ipads if you watch really closely they've got the apple covers on the back of them sometimes <laughs> but their <laughs> uh their ipads in a special case cut out for their little you know computer panels they carry around um you know i really i really did enjoy how They've done the timeline things with Star Trek, but uh, yeah, the sliding doors, yeah, that was one of them. You walk through the door, they slide open. You do that everywhere now, yeah. The uh, uh, but you know, the Star Wars getting to that one, you guys talked about that a little bit. I saw, you know, and then I think you said Robert was was uh, was catching up on the Mandalorian seasons, yeah. Um, but Andor, I thought Andor was was phenomenal. I don't. Know, it just seemed like to me it dragged. It was it was good. It was just it was like it definitely dragged on. It, it definitely it, it they 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 took their time with it, and I was curious, like you know, it's one of those shows I haven't thought. It's one of the shows that I actually thought about, like you know, of what it's telling in the story that they're dragging on, you know. Mm-hmm. And and I think they're really building up that that time distance from when the, the first episode to the last episode, that time gap went through. Mm-hmm. But they're trying to really build up a, a hatred for the Empire. And and the, this, the things that these original core people in the Rebel Alliance were, were doing back then to try to get it to a point where they were at in the movies. Mm-hmm. So... I, I, I 
thoroughly enjoyed Andor. I, I thought you know it was a great, great show, and I, I yes, it did drag on at times, but I think the story they're telling. Now, the one they did with Obi Wan wasn't too bad. Oh, Obi Wan was phenomenal. Yeah, that was great. Okay. And, and and there's so many stories there that haven't been told that I, I thought they just are worth watching. That uh, mm. you know I, I'm looking forward to. Matt says I was at a gas station yesterday and the cashier said place all your items on the scale. It automatically told everything it had. It was wild. I've seen I've used one of those at a at a Seven Eleven once. They so they got this. Uh, I think what he's talking about is it's like a it's a multi camera imaging pad mm -hmm. and there's a, a white surface in a box and it, the thing almost looks like a 3d printer if you've ever seen one of them but you know it's a mm -hmm. 20 by 30 pad that you can set everything in on and it takes a picture of it all until it figures out what you got there and charges you for it wow yeah that's another one of those another weird... attempt to remove workers huh yeah another attempt to remove the workers from the workplace that's right but uh but yeah the uh uh i don't know they're, they're all they're all really good I, you know i i jumped out and you guys start talking about it. i was like ah oh, dang it <laughs> <laughs> i am um, i was like well if cooley comes on next, next week time. i'm gonna watch it i was at a store one time and the lady had the scanner to scan stuff and she hands me it so of vine pop so i scan it and it reads the price. And I start doing this to myself. It's just like, what are you doing? She says, see, I proved it. My wife said I was worthless. <laughs> <laughs> and she just cracked up, you know. Oh, jeez. I want a stormtrooper show. I, I agree completely with Matt. He says he wants a stormtrooper like show. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, a stormtrooper show would be would be sweet to see that side of it, like mm -hmm. uh, uh, focus in like on, on like on one team or a group of guys and you know see that that would be that would be cool to see something like that. And I they wish they would do a new and improved Darth Vader because I don't know it, it, these fights he has like with the lightsaber and stuff. Come on, somebody really fast and quick would shred him like a. Like a bad piece of cake, you know. Yeah, I, I you know, we, we only really saw the really one fight between him and Obi Wan that really was. I think they played it off of of, of him being, you know, almighty and powerful, and it's his ego that he carried in from being Anakin, you know. That, uh -huh he carried into being Darth Vader and, and his young Darth Vader. And that's all the stuff he was fighting with. And, and then of course in the movies, you know, it's, I'd love to see a remake of the four five and six and at the modern time and continue that story a little bit more detailed, probably, yeah. you know, I mean, they've done it with star Trek. Why not do it with the freaking with star Wars, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I wonder how long the cars can be around though. Man. Well, they they finished off. I think Picard season three was going to be it for him, wasn't it? I th I think, but now they say they may come back with another one because they were so so open with welcome ar with open arms. You're like okay. Although that last one, that season three one was like, I thought it was off the hook. How they worked in the. Uh, the Borg and all that stuff. Oh, it was one that I like. I said I think the end of season three was some of the best television history ever. Yeah, and and you can't just go watch it. Unfortunately, you got to know the story coming up to the point. But yeah, all right, change topics here. I haven't watched your new video yet, but did your FX thirty survive the heat? So, yes, I'm currently streaming on it. It was total totally fine with it. Um. It was 109 when I did that test, put both cameras in full sun, and I, I, I set the A7R2 in crop mode, record 4K, 24, and 8-bit. That's all it does. And I set the FX30 in the same modes, uh, same record format, and except for in 10-bit. And the, the A7R2 punched out at 20 minutes. It did finally 21 minutes. I think it shut off. 
and it uh, you know overheated. While the FX30 pulled up a main, uh, it, it sounded like around uh, measuring the back panel where the fan is, mm -hmm. it was sitting about 112 degrees. Where the A7R2 behind the screen was measuring about 118 to 120 uh, when it when it checked out. And the FX30 maintained at 112, 113 degrees throughout the test um, until that punched out. And I had like 30 minutes of footage left on the card. I'm like, I'm like, well, it's it's not getting any hotter and it's not throwing me a temp warning. So uh, the handle grips were measuring around 125 degrees to the surface on the infrared. Yeah. And I, I ran... Um, the top of the bodies were about one, well, the FX30 is about 117, 118, I want to say. And the black ASMR2 was, you know, 120 plus on top of the body. It, but the FX30 never once threw a light up. So I turned off the recording and I punched it into um, all intra 4K 10 bit uh, 60p. Mm -hmm. And it ran the whole, it filled the whole 128 gigabyte card at 26 minutes of footage, no issues. Hmm. So that's how how it handled that heat test, and it, and it actually started cooling off at the end there. Um, the ambient dropped about three degrees, and the camera cooled off three degrees. So it it peaked at that 112. So I would say, uh, watch considering that it was it was running about four to five degrees hotter than ambient with the cooling fan on, and I couldn't hear the fan running during the test either. Um, couldn't feel air moving. That was the other thing. Uh, I would say this camera should be able to withstand 120 degrees heat outside, uh, no problems. I don't know about direct temperature touching, but I mean, physically you couldn't touch the cameras because it was 125 degrees. That's that's you know holding your hand and go, it's hot, you know. Yeah. And uh, and yeah, they. I mean, even just grabbing the tripod, the tripod stick was 107 when I went to grab it to move. I was, God dang, that's getting so hot. Who, who would actually, it's 120 degrees outside. I don't know. I don't think I'd even be outside. <laughs> well, know? it's consistently 110 this whole last week. It's been, a whole, whole summer, it's been 110 every day, basically, here. And we're outside working, you know. So if you if 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 I was actually doing production work, I mean, and I wanted to film these rigs running or anything like that, I'd be out in that heat running a gimbal on the camera at 110 degrees. So huh. I just know that now that, that I, I knew the A7R2 would punch out quick. It overheats without it being hot, but um, but it held up a lot longer than I thought it would. I gave it only 10 to 15 minutes estimate on my thought, and it, it held into 21 minutes before it shut down. And that was with about a 15 to 20 minute acclimation period of being just sitting out in the, in the temperature, you know, get from being in the house, didn't start dead cold. So does it have, it has a cooling fan, right? The FX30 does. The A7R2, the, the regular DSLR or mirrorless camera does not. Huh. But the FX30 has got a, you know, it's thermal protection for the, they really built it up for cinema use for heavy, heavy, you know, cooling for the, the processing. And yeah, it had no problem at all hanging in there. So what is, what is usually an FX 30 cost? 1800 bucks. Okay. So 1800 bucks plus, uh, what maybe, uh, 24 to, I mean, probably you'd want to do a 20, at least a 24 to 70 lens, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd, I'd be, and I actually ran the test with my silver lenses on it just because I was worried about my glass being in that heat. And I, 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 I think that would be my limiting factor in running these cameras out in the heat would be the glass. You know, uh, a white lens would help. And I had the silver lenses and they actually carried a hotter surface temperature um, in my initial measurement by a degree or two from the bodies of the cameras. But I figured, well, it's a lot, it, it's, it's thinner metal and it maybe just heated up quicker, but mm -hmm. I did not, wasn't going after that in my testing. So I didn't measure the lenses during the test. Um, but yeah, they, I, I would be worried about throwing my 85 one four on it and letting it sit direct sunlight for, for an hour and a half. I would be concerning to me because the, the lens and the 
it just I don't know what kind of magnification it might be doing, depending which way you're shooting. I was shooting into the sun, not directly into the sun, just you know, with the sun like this coming into the cameras. And uh I don't know if it uh if it would have would have damaged lenses or not, but I wasn't gonna risk that. I I, I said, Well, I'll I'll throw two hundred dollars worth of lenses out there, but I ain't gonna throw <laughs> throw an eighteen hundred dollar lens on it. Oh, so, so Matthew said, that's good then. It's been super hot this summer. I was trying to get a quick test using the new Polar Pro Helix 6.9. I could only stand out a little bit outside. Yeah, luckily for me, it was really dry because if it's humid, I can't stand that heat and humidity. But I was really dry that day I tested too. So I, I could stand there in the heat and not be drenched in sweat. But if you go back and watch my Dallas video, you can see the sweat fronting off my hair. <laughs> like 80% 80, 80 humidity. Can't stand humidity. I hate it. I can handle the heat and the drive usually, but Remember this when year. I lived, when I lived in Roswell, New Mexico, you, all you ever had was dry heat. Yeah, Roswell's real dry up there. Dry. Does that one have a Sony 15 millimeter currently? Do you think I should get a Sony Zoom or a Sigma? Ooh. Um, I. I would get a zoom if you already got the 15 millimeter prime. I'm guessing it's the 15 millimeter G114, is it? That's a sweet little lens, I think. I, I'm really tempted to get that for myself, but there's too many other things I want to buy right now. And, uh, but the, I, if you got the 15, I guess it depends. If I, I would think you'd want something telephoto to kind of, so, the 18105 is actually, even though it's a very old lens, it's actually a really good lens, and it's got power zoom, which is nice for the FX30, I think. Um, since you have the 15, I would I would look at that 18 to 105. If you wanted to go get full frame lenses, the the new 20 to 70 is a pretty sweet lens. I'm actually gonna hopefully have it this weekend. I gotta check. I got he's supposed to bring it to me. Uh, co-worker owns that lens that new 20 20 to 70 f4 and I'm, I'm gonna borrow it um so i can see if i can i can shoot with it because that's gonna be a i still prefer my 24 105 over it just i like the reach of the 105 but i think the 20 for for a vlogging situation would be sweet to have but again it's a full frame lens also so if you're looking at just APS-C, I, I for the money the 18 105 is hard to beat the sigmas are all really good lenses i've heard um, you have a few sigmas, don't you, really? Yeah, I've got like all of mine are art lenses, though they're really yeah, nice. they're really nice ones. Oh, yeah. uh, my buddy, my buddy's got one of the Sigma full frame, the twenty four to seventy two eight, and it's it is phenomenal. But it's a long piece. term, long term with it, he's he's noticed it's not he, even though he's impressed by what it's capable of doing and its size and price, form factor, all that. Long term, he's he's like looking at images long term because it definitely doesn't perform like a G Master lens, like one of the Sony's top tier lenses. Um, he goes, it definitely like he puts his eighty five GM on, which is you know this guy here. Uh, he goes, it just it's just night and day the difference he sees in sharpness and superb. But of course, you're talking you know high dollar prime to, yeah. I guess a, I guess a mid dollar Sigma. The Sigma art lens was like a. $1,200, the 14 and 24. Yeah. I don't know if his is an art. I don't think it is. Maybe it is. But I, but either way, it's still a zoom lens. They're not really comparing apples to apples mm -hmm. on that one. But uh, I don't think you'd go wrong with either one because I think they both work fantastic. He has no autofocus problems on shooting on A7R4 um, comparing to the Sony lenses. And, and for the price point, it's, it's a lot of bang for your buck, essentially. And shooting video, I you're only getting so much resolution out of video 4K. So any lens does good on that. Yeah, I'm not sure what you said yes to. <laughs> <laughs> but we had that. I, my buddy had the eighteen one hundred five originally with his A sixty three hundred, and and it, and I was very impressed with the images coming out of that camera. 
with that lens. It was very, very sharp and I was impressed by it, but I've thought about trying to pick one up. You can pick them up years for like 400 bucks and it's power zoom, which uh, if the FX series got the power zoom rocker on the switch. So for video, you get, you can, you can program it for how fast you want the zooms to work and, and get that transitional, you know, and it's constant F4 too. There's Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's got a little solar thing on it, so when a light hits it, it does this little wiggle thing. It's hilarious. <laughs> looks like a little stubby. It looks like the, uh, what's the alien's name from American Dad? It, <laughs> it looks like he'd be inside that suit. Yeah. <laughs> then I had, I find it here. I thought this was funny. This ticks off my daughter so badly. I put this on the dashboard of my Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> and she like, Dad, I can't believe you got that on your dashboard. <laughs> it's only up there. Huh? It's only up there to because she enjoys it so much, right? <laughs> well it's got the solar thing on there so when the light hits it it does the little hula dance thing it's hilarious yeah you guys uh, follow that channel uh where the guy built that, that actual lightsaber no i didn't no uh, let me find the name at name of this this channel because they've done some incredible stuff Um, um, Hacksmith Industries. <laughs> Matthew says, Robert Downey Jr. was probably the most perfect casted actor for the role of Iron Man. I agree. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, sure. I don't know if this is thick enough or not. Aw. Battery must be dead. Darn it. Why are you moving that? It's this guy right here. World's first lightsaber build. That's 38 million, million views on the video. Uh, it's pretty impressive when you watch the video. There's two videos on it, I think. And um, it's the, probably the closest thing to reality to a lightsaber, even though it's uh it's still it's filled by hoses so it's definitely not convenient by any means but it's about the closest thing i think they could do to, to build it oh is that the uh mock was it mock five or mock five speed racer mach five speed racer yeah and then somewhere around here i have like a Matchbox came with a collection of, of collection edition. It was the Mac, Mark Mach 5. Oh, really? It's like, it's like about that big. Yeah. I started collecting after I left. Uh, oh, geez. After I left Benz, I started collecting uh, Mercedes Hot Wheels and Matchbox cars. So I don't search for them. I don't look for them. But if I happen to walk by the, the Hot Wheels aisle or something, I'll, I'll take a quick glance. And if it's on the top cover and I find a Mercedes, I buy it. <laughs> I've, I've collected quite the collection of them so far. The Batmobile. Oh, nice. Man, it's got dust on it. Holy smokes. <laughs> and then there's the version that's like uh, the early, early, early cartoon version. Oh, yeah. Man says, what editor do you use? I'm a Final Cut user, but I've tried CapCut recently and really love it. The Mac version, of course. Um, I'm using uh, DaVinci Resolve, the free studio, the, the free version, not the studio version. I want to upgrade to the studio version, uh, but I... The thing I'm really interested in with editors is this new text-based editing and 
uh, Matthew, or not Matthew, um, uh, Mark Bowen had a video out on it recently. If you watch him, uh, and I guess Premiere Pro has it right now, and it's I guess working better than DaVinci Resolve's version in their beta testing, or, oh. or it just doesn't work as good as DaVinci. But I tried to look for it. I don't have it. It's not available on my free version. So I'm guessing it's a studio paid version only. I haven't dug into it too much because I really don't want to spend $300 on studio right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Because as soon as I find out what it does and if it's working well, I'm, I'm going to be getting it. Because basically it'll transcribe your entire recorded video. So if you do a lot of talking head stuff like I do. It'll transcribe it all, put it into a text Word document on your editor, and you can literally drag and drop, paste, cut and paste your text, and it'll cut and paste your video for you. On, on Premiere Pro, it'll sit there and, you know, have a, a cutout space. Like when you're making one of these YouTube videos, like, hey, everybody, my name is Malcolm Walker. You know, welcome to the channel. Today we're going to be talking about cameras. Uh, shit, I forgot what I was say. Oh, yeah, you know, and then you start recording. So then you have all these little cuts you're doing, you know, everywhere. <laughs> and uh, click of a button, remove all pauses. <laughs> oh, I want that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that to me, I mean, that would make me switch to Premiere Pro, even though I, I despise paying monthly subscription fees. But uh, yeah, that, that it, I hope DaVinci gets that figured out real quick because that'll be worth buying the actual studio finally for just for that time savings of being able to just cut and paste. Because I've tried different ways to make videos. It's, it's so hard to get yourself in front of the camera and just act so naturally with it and these lives help so much with it because mm -hmm. it's the same experience here with the camera other than i can look down and actually see somebody i'm talking to and uh you know be able to just spit it out stuff and then have it edit it for you would be a huge time saver for me and i could actually possibly bring my production up to two weeks with it you know or two a week but I've tried doing full scripts, you know, episodes where I've written every, the whole thing, everything I want to say out, and then I'll try to memorize little couple sentences and then write them for the camera and then put back and read the next bit, and I tell the camera. And I, it just doesn't come off – it doesn't flow off naturally off your tongue, and I just don't like that format as well. as So I started using bullet points, so I start tracking, you know, okay, what do I want to talk about, and then just naturally speak about it, and then I'll do it two or three times per bullet point. And you got a whole bunch of stuff to edit. Um, and I, I, I just, I, I, I don't know. It's just one of those things that just it makes it hard to do YouTube when you're editing yourself so much. But, uh, but it definitely has gotten better and easier to make a video. And I'm less picky about what I put out. Like, I, I don't. I know it doesn't have to be exactly perfect. It doesn't have to be a some cinematic masterpiece for every little video I make. So getting that mentality out of my head helped me a lot with what I'm able to produce and how quickly, because I would spend three or four weeks on a video before I published it. Um, where now, you know, to do a week turnaround, I, I just can't do that. I've got to, I've got to get that main cut out and review it a whole bunch, make sure I've got no double talking points left in there and, or, you know, didn't say something stupid or, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, I try to take out all my ums and thinking and all that as much as I possibly can. I, I just cut them out. And uh, that's where you'll see when my videos will jump around a lot because I'm, I'm cutting out every little three or third word, which I'm like, um. And I said, yeah, I did start a few, it's a text-based thing a few years back. I used recut for removing moving blank and then export to cap cut or final cut. So recut, I'm going to check that one out. And then uh, recut exports the timeline to all major editors, if you, or you can export video or audio as is. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna check that out because I definitely need to figure out something to help speed my way up. Because I've got the ideas; it's it's getting it filmed too is another problem for me. It's just taking the time to get set up to film, um, and then knowing what I'm gonna film because. Uh, I and and this weekend because it's I'm I'm gonna do this the shoot for the stars again i'm i'm it's gonna probably be a stinking darker skies episode that'll be out won't be out right away it's one i will spend time on to produce and make and 
Mm-hmm. You know, I try to do a high end production on those as much as I can. So for what my ability is, and, and I really want to put this FX30 through its paces for that this weekend. So I'm going to do a lot of, a lot of recording with multiple cameras and stitch it all together and make a nice, hopefully, you know, 20, 20 minute movie or something out of it to, for that episode. So I'm looking forward to doing that, mm-hmm. but it takes so much work when you're out there and you're just like, I just want to get my shot and go to bed, but <laughs> like, I got to film this too. <laughs> You set up cameras and lights, and they got to turn the lights off to do the exposures. And there's a lot. There's a lot of work to it. Definitely takes some time. So that'll be my 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 weekend plan for this weekend. But I'm gonna hopefully, like I said, I'm gonna do a how I live stream video probably and get this all filmed tomorrow night before I tear down, and then I'll. Um, check you know get that one hopefully edited by by before i leave on friday i have a video in recap i'm gonna check that out uh matt i'm gonna check that, that program out and see if it's if it cuts out the pauses that's that's a huge time saver right there and then i've been trying to be better at like n- just just talk it through and just say what i want to say and not not go back and re re revisit it so many dang times so that's definitely another Another point I got to try to fix in my own product is I'll sit there and, okay, I want to make a five minute video about this topic. And then I look at my, well, I'm like, I recorded for 32 minutes. <laughs> it's like, ah, it went by so fast. <laughs> so. I'll put that in my notebook to do. Yeah. Well, I think I'm done, guys. I've got to. I'm gonna make me work in the morning. Yeah. I gotta scramble get some stuff done. These people for the storefronts, like they're driving me nuts. It's oh like yeah. I'm, it's like I'm, uh, I called them today, left another voicemail. You know, what the time before that actually got somebody, and you think they'd want to rent these places out, right? You know, and then I've been researching um, business software for the studio, and I found uh, it's called Seventeen Hats, and it's kind of cool because you can actually take like uh, I don't know if you know who she is, Joyce Wilson. Or not, uh, I think it's Joyce. Yeah. But I'm sorry, Vanessa Joy. In 17 hats, they give you, like, you can buy these, like, uh, I guess, blocks of stuff, like, these certain photographers use for, they, what they use to reply to brides and reply to seniors. And the marketing stuff they use is kind of like a one, like, cube thing. You download it, and it's, and it merges it into your plan of what you want to do every month and stuff. Hmm. It's kind of cool, actually. They have ones for videos, too. But, I mean, it's it's like it'll remind you, oh, call so-and-so or whatever or do this. or Right, you know, right. Email that person or it's their birthday. Remind them, hey, you're running a, a birthday special and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, the people I've talked, I've, I've watched their videos gives this thing r- rave reviews, you know? Uh, Matthew's asking you, do you have any photography that you can show us or online anywhere you can see your work? Um, go to um, photographyou.photoreflect.com and then you'll have to use your email to log in, but there's a bunch of samples of my work in there. So basically I things I've done that the people order stuff from. Okay. So photograph you dot com. Dot photo reflect. Photo reflect. Dot com. And it's cool because what you can do is <clears throat> uh, basically they go in there, find what they want, order it, then they send an email back to me. I email the the high res JPEG 
to them, and then they print it and ship it off to them, and I'm done. Well, that's cool. And I want to get I want to get something going. Uh, I had a website I started, and I didn't do anything in the whole year. I had it until the like the last three or four months. I started working on it, and then I just couldn't set myself up to. I didn't want to put myself into a position where I was taking on work, I guess, because I just don't have the time for it as much as I'd like to do some things. I just don't, I have to be very selective in what I want to do on the side, I guess. So my whole website thing, I'm like, you know what, I'm not going to worry about it. So I didn't renew it. I still hold my domain uh, for my business, but I think what I want to do is, and then something I've always wanted to do is sell prints is uh, like stars or whatever I'm taking pictures yeah, of. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know, I've got... are, basically what they do is is uh they show their i mean there, there's an actual site i forgot to call and it basically uh lets that let it then they email you and tell you they take the cost of the print basically yeah there's a percentage they keep they send it right. to you and you print it and send it to them or if the other op option is too they'll have a lab that does it for you too yeah, there's there's th services out there like that, and I gotta find one that does metal prints because I I like printing on metal. Yeah, um, those are cool. And and I want to be able to just set it up where the certain prints online are set to a file that when they when an order that place prints and, and ships the order for me, mm -hmm. so I don't have to do anything. You know, footwork with having inventory or moving product or, or reshipping it. It's just all yeah, automatic, yeah. and then. They keep their cost for the print. I get my charge that I charge the customer for, you know, and, and yeah. however it works out. I know there's websites out there that honor that, that do that kind of service. And I want to get involved with that because I just don't have the time to to manage that on my own, I don't think, if I if it got busy. So I'd want to just have it just direct to a print company that prints it, ships it to the customer. And then I collect, you know, I sit back and collect, I guess, from it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's cool because on, on mine, um, it'll basically de directly deposit it in my account for me. Yeah, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna look into that one. Uh, that print for I, I've got to find something. I know there's a bunch of them out there, and there's also stock photography. You know, I want to I want to start doing some of that, even though it's the boats. I think the ship sailed on stock photography a long time ago, but. I'm in a unique area that there's not a lot of people out here doing what doing the stuff. I don't think so. I, I might be able to get some unique shots of different things happening yeah. through stock photography. So that's another one I've got to sit down and research and do. I need to set up all this back end stuff for my business. Yeah, yeah. That way yeah, it just works in the background. And uh, I definitely want to set up something with the prints and get prints dialed in. But I mean, there's a huge expense of just setting all that up. I mean, prints aren't cheap, you know. And, and knowing what they're safe to print to or, or all that, you know, I mean, it's a couple hundred bucks to do a big metal print. And, uh, but I'd love to set that up where people could go in and buy my work like that and, and you know, have it. Because have it. you could do, like, digital signatures on them and stuff or painted signatures with the paint pen that the computers do. You can download your signature and do all that. But I... I'm not too worried about any of that. I just want to just sell them, you know, share my work and have people, people buy it if they want it. Yeah. I've had really good success with the metal prints of the stars I've done, uh, you know, locally and everybody. And I've, I've sold copies off of them. You know, people wanted to buy them. So, uh, Matthew says pond five is something I would like to look into. And he also jumps in and says, take care guys. Have a good rest of your week. Hey, Matthew, I really appreciate you stopping by and joining us tonight. Uh, do please hit that like button for me on your way out. If you haven't already, uh, definitely helps these live streams, uh, kick off. And, you know, today we had a really good outpour, uh, or we had a good, good crew of people, uh, in the beginning, it sounded like we had, had like four views, uh, um, pretty consistent. So that was, that's good for this, this channel. Um, and Matthew, definitely come over and check out, uh, if you're still here, come over to check out Robert Silver's on Thursdays. It's at 5 p.m. Pacific if you're available. If not, go jump in one of his uh, reruns. And they're pretty good information for just photography in general. And 
They've been getting he's been getting into video quite a bit lately, so it's always good information over there. Yeah. But I appreciate you stopping by and having having a chat with us. And uh, yeah, definitely, man, get that FX30 on the live stream. Let's just join in one night. One night, love to have you on, and we should uh, figure out a, co a collab or something one time with the channel and see if we can boost this boost that channel a little bit for you. Love to love to help you out there. So, yeah. Well, dude, I think I'm going to Bamos. Yes, sir. I'm getting tired. I'm, I'm, I was hoping we'd hit three hours, but I am die. I'm dead, man. I'm, I'm uh, call it night right there. <laughs> well, you need like a little bell. All right, dude, going to bed. Yeah, have uh, a good night. I'll see you Thursday. All right. Later. All right, good night, guys. Good night, guys. Say goodnight and I'll talk to you guys later. Have a good night. We'll see you then.